Everybody's got to die, but this cemetery is full of people who've died in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And every one of them that dies of natural causes has died of nutritional deficiency disease. This is a blind spot for the medical profession. They don't get a single 30 seconds of training in nutrition, and as a result, 90% of the people in this graveyard have died long before their genetic potential of 120 and 140. But you know there's a revolution going on right now. Some extraordinary individuals are going to live to be 150 to 160. That just sounds incredible. Are there, are there people that really live that oh, long? Oh, yes. Healthcare is controversial these days, maybe because at some point in our lives we all need some. Generally, when we feel sick, we run to the family doctor for some pills, a quick fix. But one doctor is touring Idaho trying to convince us there's another way. If uh, one looked at the differences between a alternative or holistic practitioner as opposed to what you might call a straight or an orthodox practitioner, you might use five or six different uh, things to treat a patient. You might use acupuncture, nutrition, herbs, and um, uh, each one of these sort of supplement each other, they enhance each other. Our dogs get 40 minerals, our rats get 28, and our own kids get 12 or less. It's really a dog's life. It's these minerals, it's a secret. Glaciers grind up these rocks, comes out in the form of glacial milk. We're out here surveying this wheat crop. It looks beautiful, but looks are deceiving. So you can gain 20 years statistically simply by not going to medical school. 70% <laughs> of the medical doctors who treat Medicare patients flunk the exam. Can't, uh, can't I get the vitamins and minerals I need from the fresh foods that are available here? Absolutely not. So it leaves you open to diseases far, far more horrible than arthritis. And in fact, uh, today I was in contact with the oversight committee. They actually called me from the National Institutes of Health. The only way that you can get certain minerals, for instance, selenium and copper and zinc, is to eat liver three times a week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And most Americans aren't going to do that. They just don't like it. Uh, everybody in the studio is sticking their tongues out already. The answer is really not more taxes, more Medicaid and Medicare. The answer lies here with our food. I always like to start out with a little bit of a survey so I know who I'm talking to. How many of you are here tonight because you thought this was a tax protest meeting? <laughs> hey, it's an election year, it's gonna happen. And then, let's see, how many of you grew up on a farm or had anything to do with livestock sometime in your life? Okay, great, we're gonna get along fine. Now, the reason why I asked that last question, I grew up on a beef farm myself, about 80 miles west of St. Louis. Like everybody else that raises livestock, you raise a lot of your own feed to stay in business economically. And we raised corn and soybeans and hay, and we'd grind this stuff up into a flour, and we would um, add vitamins and minerals and trace minerals. We'd make pellets, and we'd feed those calves for about six to nine months, and we'd ship them off to be butchered, and we'd save back the very best ones for ourselves, and uh, you'd butcher them in the barn. Now, the thing that fascinated me as a teenager was that we ate out of those same fields as a family. We kept back five rows of corn. We had a garden at the end of the field where we grew our peas and beans and squash and tomatoes and carrots. And the part that fascinated me was I always used to ask my dad, I'd say, how come we go to all that trouble for those calves? We grind up their feed, we add vitamins and minerals and trace minerals, make pellets, feed them for six, nine months. And we want to live to be a hundred with no aches and pains. We eat out of the same fields and we don't give ourselves those same vitamins and minerals and trace minerals. Well, he used to give me a lot of Missouri farm wisdom. He'd say things like, shut up, boy. You're getting farm fresh food, fresh air, lots of free exercise, don't ask complicated questions. So I was glad to get rid of the farm exercise and go to ag school at the University of Missouri. And there my major was in animal husbandry and nutrition. My minor was in field crops and soils. And I began to learn technical things about soil chemistry and how it related to tons and bushels per acre. But I didn't get a real answer to my question until I became a freshman veterinary student also at the University of Missouri. And there I learned that the reason why we put all these vitamins and minerals and trace minerals into animal feeds is simply because we don't have insurance for them. We don't have Blue Cross, Blue Shield, major medical, hospitalization, Medicare, Medicaid, or Hillary to watch out for them. And if we were to use a human health care type of system for animals, it'd be sticker shock for everybody. Your hamburger would cost you $275 a pound. Boneless, skinless chicken breast would be $450 a pound. A dozen eggs would be 50 bucks. So we learned that we could keep the cost of animal products such as meat and dairy and poultry and eggs down to where the average person could afford them simply by reducing or eliminating the health care cost. We do this by preventing and curing diseases in animals with nutrition. 
And that whole concept really fascinated me all through veterinary school. And after graduating vet school, I went to Africa for two years with Marlon Perkins from the old Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom days and got to play Frank Buck for a couple of years and use the tranquilizer gun and tromp all over Central and South Africa. And after two years, Marlon sent me a telegram and invited me back to St. Louis to work on a big project. Uh, this was in the early 60s. He'd gotten a $7.5 million grant to study pollution, the environment, the ecology, and they needed a wildlife veterinarian on the project. And my job was to do autopsies of animals that died of natural causes in the big zoos around the United States. This, of course, included the St. Louis Zoo with Perkins directly, the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, the Bronx Zoo in New York, the National Zoo in D.C., the L.A. Zoo, and many, many other big zoos throughout the United States. And my job was to do autopsies on animals that died of natural causes and to look for a species of animals that was ultra-sensitive to pollution. And we're going to use that animal much like the old coal miners used to use canaries. You remember how that goes? They take a canary in a little cage down in the mine, and if methane gas or carbon monoxide would leak into the mine, the canaries, being more sensitive, would drop off the perch and die and give the men a chance to get out before they suffocated or blew up. We were supposed to set up colonies of these animals in strategic locations around the United States, and if they became ill or died from pollution, we would know that there was some impending environmental doom that we had to deal with to save the human population. And that was back in the 60s. Now, after having worked on this project for some 12 plus years, I had done 17,500 autopsies on over 454 species of animals, plus 3,000 human beings for comparison. And what I learned was that every animal and every human being who dies of natural causes dies of a nutritional deficiency disease. And I got all excited about this nutrition stuff again and wrote 75 scientific papers for medical journals, veterinary journals, international pathology journals, contributed chapters to eight multi-author textbooks on the subject, wrote one of my own, it was 1,000 pages, it was 2,000 pictures, and uh, I think it cost 140 bucks each. Medical students and veterinary students had to buy them to pass the course. I don't know if they ever read them, but it was one of those things they had to buy them to pass the course. So we sold a few of those books. And uh, even though I had tried to get this information out in standard uh, research channels through papers and lectures and whatnot, there was lots of competition. So I, I really didn't get the interest of the people who were in power, either in politics or medical research. Although things like uh, 2020 with Hugh Downs and Geraldo, I did get to, to go on that program. Uh, before Geraldo got his nose broke for the first time and uh, was in 1,700 newspapers throughout the world with that story and UPI and AP. But I uh, really couldn't get anybody interested. We had a lot of competition. We just put men on the moon. We had a high-tech Cold War going on with the Soviets. We had um, declared war on cancer and committed $23 billion to finding cures and vaccines in 1971. So I became frustrated enough. I went back to school for four years up in Portland, Oregon, became a physician. And I practiced there for 12 years as a general family practitioner and delivered babies and sewed up chainsaw wounds, took care of hemorrhoids, all the things you do as a general family practitioner. But the thing that gave me the most pleasure was to use everything I had learned in veterinary nutrition on my human patients. And it was no surprise to me. It works just as well in people as it does in animals. Now, I was always very honest with my patients. I put my veterinary degree on the wall next to the medical degree. And they'd come in and they'd spot that. And they'd say, Doc, I'm in the right place. I'm here for a physical. It looks like you're a vet. And I'd uh, say, look, I won't give you a rabies shot if you don't deserve it. <laughs> and if I saw that they were from the farm on their intake survey, I used to keep one of these full-length obstetrical gloves, you know, I'd put that on and kind of wave it in front of their face like I was going to examine a mare or a cow, right? And I'd put that on or do, do a little AI, and their eyes would get as big as saucers because they knew right what that was. And some of them would panic and run out the door. Some of them was kind of like basketball defense, you know, it was... They'd never turn their back on me because they're afraid, you know. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun, the patients and I. And uh, they taught me a lot of useful things. And I like to think I gave them some useful information. We're going to go over that tonight. And if you take home just 10% of what I share with you, I believe you're going to save yourself an enormous amount of unnecessary misery. You're certainly going to save yourselves a gob of money. And you're going to add many, many healthful years to your life if you just take home 10%. Now, there's no extra charge if you want to take home 50% or 100%, but I'll sleep well if you take home 10%. I always like to start out by sharing with you that the human being has the genetic potential to live healthfully to be 120 to 140. Absolutely no doubt about this. Everybody in this room has the genetic capability to live to be 120 to 140. Um, unfortunately, Americans don't do a very good job when it comes to longevity. Our average lifespan is 75.5, about half of what we're genetically capable of, 
And in 1990, when the World Health Organization examined the top 32 industrialized nations around the world uh, for a variety of health things, uh, longevity and so forth, um, we didn't rank very well. Uh, we ranked 17th in longevity amongst the top 32 first world countries. That meant that there were 16 other countries whose peoples live longer than we do. We ranked 19th in healthfulness. That meant there were 18 other countries whose peoples live longer than we do before they develop diabetes and high blood pressure and heart disease and arthritis and, and cancer. We ranked 23rd when it came to live births and first year survivability of babies. And we ranked dead last, 32nd out of 32, when it comes to preventing birth defects. And what all these statistics mean is that we have the highest priced healthcare system in the world, but not the best. And you're a witness to that. Uh, if everything was perfect with your health or the health of your loved ones, if everything was perfect with the health care system, you'd be home doing something else tonight. And so just the fact that you're interested to get additional information for your health, for the health of a loved one, says a lot. It's a testimony uh, for what's going on in the health care system today. Now, everybody has some little ritual that they do on a regular basis, whether it's daily or several times a day or several times a week that they believe will add healthful years to their life. And it ranges from doing exercise, meditation, yoga, things like wearing Bergen stocks. Uh, there's things like um, being a vegetarian, juicing, ripping the chicken skin off your chicken, taking an aspirin every day, all these various things that we're told to do and grandma passes down groups of herbs to you, combinations and so on. Let's have a look at three or four and see if there's any proof in the pudding that there's any real benefit to these things. And let's start out with what is called the Paleolithic lifestyle. This is where you're supposed to live and eat like a caveman. Uh, you're supposed to eat everything raw, raw vegetables, raw grains. You can't eat any Iowa corn-fed beef. You have to chase down low-fat antelopes with your Bergenstock feet and <laughs> choke them to death with your bare hands because, you know, a gun and, and bow and arrow are inhumane. So let's see if there's any proof in the pudding that there's any benefit to that type of lifestyle. And the only real hard evidence we have here is old Otzi. Otzi, of course, was a mummified corpse that was found in the Otzvel Valley of the Italian Alps when a glacier melted and receded farther than it had any time in human history. And when they examined this fellow's corpse, they found out that he was in the prime of life when he died, somewhere between 25 and 40 years of age. They knew he was from the Copper Age because all of his tools and weapons on his person were pure copper, and that ranged between four and 6,000 years ago. And the part of this thing that fascinated me was they did a, a carbon dating on his tissues and, and narrowed it down that he had died 5,300 years ago. And they did a series of x-rays on him to see if he had any of the degenerative diseases that plague modern man. Things like cancer and uh, tuberculosis, things like oh, syphilis and so on. But what they found out was this. He had severe degenerative arthritis of the cervical vertebrae of his neck, lumbar vertebrae of his lower back and of both hips. Additionally, he had hardening of the arteries. He had coronary artery disease. He had hardening of the arteries, arteriosclerosis of the AR to pulmonary artery and of the iliac arteries going down into both of his legs. And I guarantee you, he didn't eat three eggs for breakfast every morning. Certainly didn't eat any Big Macs. He didn't eat any Iowa corn-fed beef. All of the things that are blamed on these types of degenerative diseases. So there is no proof in the pudding that the Paleolithic lifestyle has any health or longevity benefit. Then there's the meditation and yoga, the body, mind, spirit thing that was brought to the United States during the 60s and 70s by the flower children. The hippies kind of died out for a while and has been reawakened in the last couple of years by Deepak Chopra, who's written, I don't know, at least five best-selling books on the subject. Let's see if there's any proof in the pudding that meditation and yoga have any longevity or health benefit. Rita Guerra, age 55 and, and thought to be the premier meditation and yoga instructor in the Western Hemisphere. Um, was the director of the Himalayan Institute in Chicago. She was a vegan, a type of vegetarian that doesn't eat any animal products whatsoever. And uh, she thought she was so spiritually elevated she didn't need to supplement any of her diet with vitamins and minerals. And as a result, she died at age 55 from a simple deficiency of a trace mineral called selenium, a cardiomyopathy heart attack. So there's no proof in the pudding that the body, mind, spirit approach meditation and yoga has any health or longevity benefit. Can calm you down during tax season and finals week, but no health and longevity benefit. Then there's this uh, organic food movement, which has been around since Adele Davis. And people mistakenly believe that uh, organically grown food is, is healthier for you. Uh, from the standpoint of nutrition than is non-organically grown food. And organic means it's just grown without sprays, no herbicides or pesticides. And certainly it's safer from the standpoint of cancer. But what about everything else? Well, certainly 
it doesn't work very well because it just means there's no sprays on it. It says nothing. There's no warranty or guarantee that there's more vitamins or minerals in there. And there was a guy who wrote two best-selling books on the subject, The Secret Lives of Plants and The Secrets of the Soil. His name was Chris Bird, Christopher Bird. I'd known him for 25 years. And I, I used to give him as a present, I would just give him minerals and things, trying to save his life because he had snow white hair, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And he just poo-pooed. He says, I'm eating organically grown food. I don't need to take anything else. And I was in, about three weeks ago, I was in the airport in Atlanta reading the local newspaper. And guess whose obituary is in there in big, bold letters? Christopher Bird uh, wrote The Secret Lives of Plants and the Secrets of the Soil. 68 years old, he drops dead from a stroke, even though he was eating nothing but organically grown food. So there is no proof in the pudding that that in of itself has any health or longevity benefit. Then there's the subject of meat. A lot of people say, oh, you can't live to be healthful if you eat a lot of meat. You've got to give up meat. You have to be a vegan or a vegetarian of some type or another. And I've listened to that for years. And, of course, my personal credo is that a day without a hamburger is like a day without sunshine. <laughs> so I was happy to see this. I was up in Colorado last week, and uh, they found that in Colorado there's 400 people over the age of 100. They're 105 and 109 and, and so forth. There's 400 people over the age of 100, and the only common thread, they're different races and different religions and have different dietary lifestyles, but the only common thread between all these 400 people who are over age 100, they're heavy meat eaters. They're heavy meat eaters is the only common thread. So, yes, for us meat eaters. <laughs> then there's, see you guys, it was worth your coming here tonight, wasn't it? <laughs> Then there's this salt thing. You know, everybody, oh, you got to give up salt because it causes high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, you've got to give up salt. What's the first thing a good farmer puts out for his livestock? It's about that big. It's a salt block, right? And, of course, I refuse to believe that my patients are dumber than an old cow. And so I used to tell them, hey, just go ahead and take all the salt you want. And people would shrink and, and, and tear and say, Wallach, you're, you're flying in the face of all the weight of medical evidence. You're going to kill people telling them to salt their food. And, of course, there never is, there never was, and there never will be any weight of medical evidence that says salt is bad for you. It certainly does not cause high blood pressure. This came out just a couple of days ago, May 22nd, Wednesday, May 22nd, just about a week ago now. And there was a study that was done that came out in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the most prestigious medical journal in the world. They looked at 56 studies that had been done around the world on salt and high blood pressure, and they combined them into one study, and some doctors from Toronto uh, Medical School up at the uh, University of Toronto researched all this, and they said, hey, people who have normal blood pressure, there's no benefit to restricting your salt intake. It does not protect you from high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, only 5% of the people with high blood pressure get any benefit from restricting salt, only 5%, and then they only reduce their blood pressure by 3.7 millimeters of mercury. If your blood pressure is up 25, 30, 40 points, it's kind of stupid to give up salt for other reasons um, because it has nothing to do positively for your health. What he did say over here was that uh, there's so many doctors that have a vested interest in getting people off the of salt that they told them to get off the of salt. You have to keep coming in and getting medicine and water pills and this, that, and the other. Why would they tell you to go ahead and salt your food and stay home and enjoy yourself? You know? And so there is no proof in the pudding that getting salt out of your diet has any health or longevity benefit. One more, then we'll get into the longevity thing. Th this last one is the subject of the Mediterranean diet. This is the one that the medical profession has jumped on. They say the Mediterranean diet is the answer for the health and longevity and optimal health. And what they want you to do is give up red meat and eat lots of chicken and poultry and lots of fruit and vegetables, a little wine was okay according to the Mediterranean diet. But there is no proof in the pudding that it has any health or longevity benefit because the Greeks and the Italians who eat the most of it live to be 75.5 just like us. And here's a hard example. Pope John Paul II, of course, uh, is the uh, Pope of all the uh, uh, Catholics and, and big Catholic population in Italy. And you'd like to think that if anybody in Italy was getting the very best that the Mediterranean diet would have to offer, it'd be the Pope. Now, he's 76 years old, just turned 76 years old, two years ago had his hips replaced because of degenerative arthritis and osteoporosis. He has failing health. He has to cancel half of his speaking engagements and half of his administrative duties. He just simply does not have enough strength to do that anymore. And 76 is about half of what we're genetically capable of when it comes to longevity. So unless he's been sneaking in poly sausage under the table for the last 17 years since he's been in Rome, there is no proof in the pudding that the Mediterranean diet has any health or longevity benefit. 
Let's have a look at just how old you can live to be if you do everything right. Is it worth going to a little effort? I, I believe it is, and I'm going to prove it to you. Christian Mortensen here in August of 1995, about, uh, what, almost nine months ago now, turned 113, plays golf once a week, looks like he's about 85 years old, looks pretty good for 113. Then this gal here, Dora Ramothebe from South Africa, turned 114 in July of 1995. And when the media and the press ran to her and said, Dora, what do you attribute your health and longevity to? She did not say, I owe it all to my HMO. <laughs> she did not say, hey, I never failed to take that invitation and go in for my annual physical. What she said was this, I eat locust every day, you know, grasshoppers. Uh, pumpkin seeds, tortoise meat, not a vegetarian, wild herbs, dried fruit, and starts each day with a cup of coffee. So we're beginning to connect the dots and put together what it takes to live to be over 100. Don't rush to the bait store because crickets won't work. It has to be grasshoppers. <laughs> this gal here, Jean Calment, from France, in February, February 21st, 1995, turned 120 and was documented by the Guinness World Book of Records as being the oldest living woman in the world. And uh, she rode her bike until she was 105 years of age and uh, volunteered as a librarian in the uh, Paris Library. And then a year later, February 21st, 1996, just a couple months ago, she turned 121 and she's still documented as the oldest living woman in the world by the Guinness World Book of Records. This fellow here from a little town outside of Bogota, Colombia, his name was uh, or is, he's still alive, Francisco Barros Nuevo Chaparina. Uh, when he was asked by reporters what did he attribute his health and longevity to, he said that he drinks a gallon of goat's milk every day. And the part that fascinated me about his birthday story is that 40 years ago his doctors told him he only had a couple of months to live. And his sons built him a coffin, and every morning for 40 years he's been waking up, sitting by that coffin, waiting to die. <laughs> Nighttime comes, he goes to bed. Wakes up, sits by the coffin, waiting to die. He's been doing that every morning for 40 years because the doctor told him he was going to die in a couple of months. Probably didn't have a calendar. You know, just... And, of course, all the doctors who told him that 40 years ago are long since dead. <clears throat> in addition to turning 125 and still going strong, uh, he was still fathering children at age 90. So there's hope for some of you guys going to sleep in the back of the room already. <laughs> This gal here, Mazumi Dusty from Iran, according to the Iranian news agency. This was in the Rocky Mountain News from Denver a little over about a year and a half ago now, January 1995. She died at age 161. And the interesting thing about her obituary to me is that she was survived by six living children ranging in age from 120 to 128. They had never even left home to go to college yet. <clears throat> And her oldest son, Golam, said his mother had never visited a doctor nor taken any chemical medications or drugs or pharmaceuticals, did take a few herbs during her life. So again, we're beginning to collect more information of what it takes to live to be over 100. Now let's look at a, a fellow from the United States who is a favorite son, of course, I believe, uh, especially for people who are interested in alternative health, Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling uh, was famous for a variety of reasons. Number one, he was one of two people to ever get two unshared Nobel Prizes. Certainly one of the geniuses of our century, maybe of all time. He was also famous for his interest in vitamin C. And uh, he was trained in classical biochemistry and nutrition in medical schools and, and universities. And so he believed you could get all of your vitamins and minerals and trace minerals, amino acids and fatty acids from eating your four food groups. But he also believed that you needed to take extra vitamin C because of the pollution in our air, water, and food, and because of all the stresses of modern day life. And so he personally took 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day for 35 years. Never missed a lick. 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day for 35 years. And he still died seven years short of the magic number of 100. Died at age 93, and he died of widely disseminated prostate cancer. Well, after reading all of his materials and scientific articles in, in nutritional journals and physiology journals and so on, and an additional 400 articles by various authors on vitamin C, here's what I can guarantee you. If you faithfully take 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day for 35 years like Linus Pauling did, and you're a woman, I will guarantee you that you will never get prostate cancer. <laughs> That's the only guarantee I can make about vitamin C. 
there's absolutely no doubt that the human being can live to be 120 to 140. People do it all the time. Well, after spending many, many years, perhaps 30 years, looking and reading and studying on health and longevity in both veterinary journals and human medical journals, here's what I can tell you. No matter how you look at health and longevity, there's really only two basic concepts that you have to be concerned with. Concept number one I refer to as uh, avoid stepping on the landmines. This is where you don't want to throw away your life wastefully. You don't want to smoke. You don't want to abuse alcohol. Certainly don't do drugs. Don't jog down the highway at 2 o'clock in the morning wearing an all-black ninja suit. You're going to get hit by a truck mirror, right? Uh, you don't want to jump out of a hot air balloon from 250 foot up with a 300 foot bungee cord. The math doesn't work out. Then uh, there's a lot of crazy things people do. Uh, certainly, uh, lastly, I would say you want to avoid going to a medical doctor because given half a chance, they will kill you. <laughs> now, as flippant as this might sound to some of you, and I know there may be some health professionals in here tonight, and I applaud you for being here if you are. This happens to be from April 14, 1996, the Sunday Supplement Magazine, Parade Magazine, many newspapers around America, and they did a whole special issue on when doctors are the problem. Now, I've been talking about this for 25 years, and so this is, they're kind of, what, uh, 25 years late, but better late than never in this case. In, in April, excuse me, in January, January 13th of 1993, January 13th, 1993, Ralph Nader came out with the results of a three-year study on hospitals and, and deaths and infections and injuries that occurred in those hospitals, 1,500 pages, and uh, there's all kinds of things that he said, but I'm going to give you one of the bottom lines, which just was a shocker to me. He said, quote, 300,000 Americans are killed each year in hospitals alone as a result of medical negligence, unquote. 300,000. To appreciate how big a figure that is, remember, he used the word killed. That means that somebody did something to them to dispatch them. They didn't just die accidentally. They were killed, according to Ralph Nader, not me. Let's compare that with 10 years of, of military operations in Vietnam. And over that 10 years, we had lost 56,000 military personnel for an average of 5,600 a year. And for these military losses, millions of people poured out in the streets and protested. We had political anarchy the last three years of that 10-year war. Uh, we chased a president out of the presidency, and God forgive us, we shot and killed American students in Kent State, Ohio, demonstrating against that war. And this was for 5,600 military personnel a year. Now comes Ralph Nader and says, here's one profession or one trade who kills 300,000 Americans a year through negligence, and you can't even find a crazy street preacher out here in any corner protesting it. Well, who is it that they kill? Is it just the homeless? They go under the bridges and, you know, things like that and get the, the homeless and take them to the teaching hospitals, take them down in the basements and practice on them. It's not that simple, of course. It's a little more complicated. Uh, well, let's see. We've got 600 or plus people in here tonight. How many of you remember... Betsy Lehman. Anybody remember the name Betsy Lehman? Okay, not a single soul. I'm going to remind you who Betsy Lehman was. Just about a year ago, April of 1995, um, Betsy Lehman, uh, who was the Pulitzer Prize winning medical reporter from the Boston Globe, the second largest newspaper in America, 39 years old, developed breast cancer. And she sat down by her computer and scientifically examined all the cancer treatment centers in the world, not just her own hometown. And she looked at the successful ones and who had terrible safety records and who was on the cutting edge of, of research for breast cancer. And she chose the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston as her cancer treatment center. And she went in for her first and what turns out to be her last chemotherapy treatment. They killed her with a 16 times overdose. They gave her a four-day dose every day for four days, and they killed her. Now, because she was famous, she was written up in Time magazine and, and in every newspaper uh, in America because, again, she was a Pulitzer Prize-winning medical reporter for the Boston Globe. But remember, there were still 299,999 Americans killed in 1995 by the medical profession, according to Ralph Nader. She was just one that was uh, highlighted. Now, this one here, I'm going to share this last one with you. And I want to absolve everybody involved with this presentation tonight, including the Civic Center and yourselves and any company involved and so forth. This is my own personal thing. And if anybody gets arrested, sued, or assassinated, it will be me. So you're absolved of any of this danger. You recognize this gal here as a photograph, a little fuzzy because I lifted it out of a magazine. And the reason why I like this photograph of Jackie Kennedy is that 
It was taken of her three days before she entered the hospital in New York for her first and what turned out to be her last chemotherapy treatment for cancer. She was taking a stroll in this picture in, in uh, Central Park in New York on a brisk day with a friend. And um, she was diagnosed six months before her death as having non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a type of cancer that normally takes 10, 12, 15 years to kill you. It's relatively painless, say, in comparison to pancreatic cancer, which can kill you in three to six months and be excruciatingly painful. And when she went in for her first chemotherapy treatment, there was no death watch on her because there was no anticipation she was going to die. After all, she had 10, 12, 15 years left to go. Goes in on Friday night. Tuesday, she's dead. And you're supposed to believe that Jackie Kennedy died of cancer. Well, as a pathologist and a clinician, I'll guarantee as sure as God made little green apples, Jackie Kennedy did not die of cancer. She died of an overdose of chemotherapy just like Betsy Lehman. And if they can kill a Jackie Kennedy and they can kill a Betsy Lehman and not a single thing happened to any of those doctors, they weren't sued, they weren't dismissed, their licenses weren't suspended, nothing happened to those clinics or hospitals, what chance does the average person out in the street have? Not very much. Now here's another survey that Ralph Nader did in July of 1994. In this one, he looked at the relationship between doctors, medical doctors, and seniors, people over age 65. This happens to be from the front page of the USA Today. I just like the color pictures. It was in every newspaper in America. And what this uh, study said was this. 70% of the doctors who treat Medicare patients flunked the exam on how to prescribe to the elderly safely and effectively. 70% flunked the exam. Now, what would happen to American Airlines if 70% of their pilots flunked the exam on how to fly? <laughs> what would happen to American Airlines if they killed 300,000 passengers a year? You see all this big hoo-ha going on over the value jet where they killed 109 people, right? Now, the reason why this difference is this. When a jet goes down and, and splatters parts of people's bodies, you know, say 200 passengers over a hillside or a swamp, it's pretty hard to hide. And so, you know, it's a kind of a gruesome thing. But in the medical profession, it's more subtle than that. Obviously, if doctors were to line up cancer patients and, and AIDS patients and people with uh, diabetes along the wall and mow them down with a machine gun to save money for treatment, then people would protest because that's very blatant. But here's one of the many examples that Ralph Nader gave as to why this is missed. Because it, people are busy with their lives. You have kids and grandkids. You have jobs and, and things to do. And so you're not going to sit there and, and kind of keep an eye on things. You assume that somebody else is doing it. Well, here's what Ralph Nader said. 32,000 hip fractures each year in America are attributed to prescriptions or prescribing by medical doctors that leaves the elderly sedated and unbalanced. And they fall over and fracture a hip, trying to avoid stepping on the kid or getting out of the tub, getting out of the car. And this is a death sentence for 29,000 of these people. Remember, 75% over the age of 65 don't live 90 days. They die of complications, pneumonia, uh, stroke, and uh, pulmonary embolism and others. And I believe that doctors should be held responsible for this just the way that um, bartenders are when they let people drink too much and drive home and kill somebody else or themselves. And there's manslaughter and second degree murder and wrongful death, however, uh, you know, whatever applies to that case. And there is an organization called MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, because there's 15,000 Americans every year killed by drunk drivers. Any members of MAD in this audience tonight, M-A-D-D? -D? Any members? Yeah, there's a couple. At any rate, I believe they should redirect their energies towards physicians. Because physicians, according to Ralph Nader, kill 300,000 Americans a year. And they don't even have to change their towels or their letterhead. They could keep their initials mad, just change their name to Mothers Against Dumb Doctors. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, a couple of more in concept number one. I think you'll have the idea. Um, one of my favorite surveys. It was done by Harvard Medical School. It was published in 1972. And what they did was look at the, the drug use, both the illegal street drug use and the illegal use of prescription drugs by medical doctors on themselves on a weekly basis. And what they found out was pretty shocking. They found out that 52% of licensed medical doctors in America use psychotropic drugs on themselves each and every week. This included cocaine, marijuana, speed, barbiturates, opium derivatives, and things like fentanyl. So what that means is, if you choose to go to a doctor for every little thing when you leave here tonight, don't be too excited about their degrees and certificates and, and uh, licenses hanging on the wall. What you want to do is very carefully look at the pupils of their eyes and, <laughs> and see if they're gorked out on something before you let them examine you or uh, prescribe to you or do any kind of procedure. Even scarier to me is that 78% of the medical students in America use psychotropic drugs on themselves illegally each week. 
And down deep in your heart, do you really believe that when they graduate school and go out and practice, do they quit using drugs? No, they can get the good stuff now because they're making money, right? Here's an example. I have thousands of these, but here's an example. Dr. Michael A. Potler, 30 years old, just about three years out of his residency, we knew he was a kind of doctor who's going to be in trouble because he's wearing Birkenstocks, right? <laughs> now, he killed himself in an overdose of, of um, drugs, and uh, you know he gave himself an intravenous injection, a recreational thing, and killed himself. And because he was a medical doctor, they eulogized him on the front page of the San Diego newspaper. He saved the lives of children but lost his own. And in the article, it said he devoted his whole life to caring for children. Now, unless he was a babysitter or a pedophile most of his life, that had to be a lie because he was only out of his residency for three years. Additionally, he was a thief because of drugs he killed himself with, he stole out of the hospital pharmacy. He was additionally malignant and dumb because after 14 years of medical school, he still couldn't read the syringe right and killed himself with an overdose. I mean, these kids who drop out of high school and can't even read, write, and do math live in cardboard boxes. They do drugs every year forever and ever and ever and don't kill themselves. <laughs> now this is from the editorial page of the Washington Post, Washington, D.C., November 2, 1992. Lining Doc's Pockets. If you go to a doctor, your doctor, you want him to think of you as a patient, not a cash cow, but two studies in this month's New England Journal of Medicine shows that doctors are out to milk you dry. And if you're from a farm, you know what that means, what a cash cow is. Ten months later in the Reader's Digest, very interesting article, September 1993, and to me the Reader's Digest is the sweetest little magazine that ever was. Never, never says anything negative about any one or any individual or any group. And so I was really surprised to see this. And on page 77 it says, can you trust your doctor? And it lists 12 ways that doctors routinely scam patients. I'll give you the worst one. You can go look up the other 11, September 1993. The worst one, according to Reader's Digest, not me, the average doctor in America gets $421 in kickbacks every time he refers somebody in for a CAT scan or an MRI. And you thought doctor loved you when he said, you know, we've been fighting that bursitis in that shoulder for five years and giving you heroic injections of cortisone in there and it's just getting worse. Let's, you know, you've got good insurance and you've got good Medicare supplement, it's not going to cost you anything. Let's run you in and see if that bursitis is really arthritis. Cha-ching, 421 bucks. Now, According to Reader's Digest, not Joel Wallach, the average doctor in America gets $226,681 a year, almost a quarter of a million dollars in CAT scan kickbacks. And you wonder why health care costs keep spiraling upwards. Now, the best way to keep track of doctors and keep a scorecard on them is to look at the obituaries in your town. Uh, and it's not gruesome, but you should look in there. And if everybody is dying in their 50s, uh, that should uh, give you some concern. You know, everybody should be dying in their 80s and 90s and 100s. If everybody's dying of kidney disease, you don't want to go to the urologist in your town. So, you know, just kind of take a glance through the obituaries and see if there's any kind of picture that's developing here. About a year and a half ago, uh, this obituary appeared in the San Diego newspaper, and it's a national-level tragedy obituary. Grace Masira, age 48, died of a widely disseminated breast cancer, a horrible thing. It used to be a disease of older women. Today it's a disease of teenage girls. It's one of those things that's gotten worse over the years, and uh, there's a variety of reasons for this, but certainly chemotherapy and radiation has not solved the problem. But anyway, this little headline here, given radiation as a baby, I want to know what that had to do with her obituary. So I read her obituary and said when she was six months of age, her pediatrician shrank her thymus gland with radiation from an x-ray machine because he didn't know what else to do. She was kind of a sickly kid, and they, you know, they took out her tonsils or adenoids and they said, well, there's nothing else to do. Let's just shrink her thyroid, or th or, excuse me, her thymus gland. So what a terrible thing to do. Who on earth would do such a thing? Everybody knows your thymus gland is there to activate your killer T cells and protects you from viruses and cancer and that sort of thing. Nobody in their right mind would do such a thing. So I went into the medical literature between 1945 and 1950 and looked at all the pediatric medical journals. And sure enough, it was common practice back then because the Army and Navy had given all the medical doctors in America free x-ray machines when they closed down all these field hospitals and this, that, and the other, and they gave these mobile x-ray machines to all the doctors. Hey, go out and try them, doc. You know, you're a doctor. 
and uh, it was common practice. And according to the U.S. Department of Energy, one million American babies under the age of one year had their thymus glands shrunk between 1945 and 1950. One million. Not a single foreign enemy has ever radiated in America, neither civilian or military. And the one profession who says, well, trust me, my dear, radiated one million American babies. Now, according to the American, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, these kids have either already died of cancer, they're currently under treatment for cancer, or they project they're going to die of cancer based on the amount of radiation they receive to their neck and chest to shrink their thymus glands. Now, you wonder what the pupils looked like in the eyes of this surgeon up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, about a year ago, when he took off the normal breast and left the cancerous one on. No sober surgeon can make that mistake. I mean, even if he was dyslexic, he couldn't make that mistake. Because if he's dyslexic, the surgical nurses know that, and they'll take a red wax pencil and put a bullseye on the correct breast and put a red ribbon on the guy's wrist and say, Doc, just match the colors. Even a dyslexic can match colors. So you know this guy had to be gorked out on something. And uh, the poster child, as it turns out, for Americans who've been injured and killed in American hospitals, turns out to be a, name of a, a guy by the name of Willie King. Willie King went into the University Community Hospital in Tampa, Florida to get his right leg amputated. He had uncontrolled diabetes. He had gangrene in that leg. The bones were sticking out of his toes. His skin was slipping off and his flesh smelled like rotten meat in a garbage can on a hot July night. And the surgeons promptly cut off his normal left leg. Now it turned out okay for Willie because they cut off his other leg for free. <laughs> kind of balanced him up a little bit. A couple more, and I think you'll have the picture. Dr. Raymond Sattler, a neurosurgeon from North Carolina, uh, got his license suspended for 30 days, according to this article, because he left the surgical room after he had exposed the patient's brain to the air. He left the patient's brain exposed for 25 minutes and it dried out a little bit, and well, he ran out and got some lunch. Now, I don't believe that was the case, because I've done a lot of surgery. And when you get to the point where you're kind of dancing around, you know, when you have to go to the bathroom or you're hungry, it's not the sort of thing that you're going to leave a patient. What you do is you go faster. You, know, you put the stitches farther apart, and you put fewer in, but you get it done before you leave. And I believe that this fellow is one of those 52% of the medical doctors who do drugs every week and uh, had to run into the bathroom and snort some cocaine or give himself an injection to calm himself down. And I base this opinion on remarks and statements from the medical board of North Carolina. And they said, Dr. Raymond Sattler forgot the names of surgical instruments during the operation and told his nurse to drill holes in the patient's head with a Black & Decker drill. I mean, it was like Sears Home Repair. And she didn't know what she was doing. She injures the patient, so he got his license suspended for 30 days. This fellow here is a chest surgeon in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, he was uh, on the staff of the Osteopathic Medical Center of Texas and um, uh, took out the normal right lung and left the cancerous left lung in. I guarantee you, he immediately knew that because whenever you remove something that has cancer in it, you always take your scalpel and you cut through it several times, take a representative sample, put it in some preservative, and send it to the lab so they can tell you exactly what's going on there so you know how to pursue treatment. So this guy knew immediately. And of course, it didn't tell anybody. He says, well, nobody will know. Well, it just so happens that this uh, patient went in uh, for autopsy after he died, and the pathologist said, wait a minute, the results here at the autopsy don't jive with the surgical record. And so just to kind of keep things quiet, the surgeon settled for $9 million with the family, never going to a jury. And why would he do that? Why wouldn't he spend $250,000 worth of, of um, uh, legal fees when the, uh, his malpractice insurance would pay for that, would pay for those legal fees and get it down to $5 million or $4 million or $2 million? He didn't do that. Well, the reason is, I guarantee you, he couldn't find another physician or a nurse who would testify that he was sober during the procedure. And if that would have gone before a jury, the award to the family would have been $100 million. So he was lucky and glad to get off with a $9 million settlement. Now, one of the things that I think should, should be standard and, and taught in medical schools is what a dead patient looks like and what a live patient looks like. That should be standard. Death 101, Life 101, those should be standard courses. But you're never quite sure that they have this kind of information when you see stuff like this. This gal here, Mildred C. Clark, 86 years old, was found cold, stiff, and blue on her nursing home apartment floor. And the house doctor came in and couldn't find a pulse and respiration. He said, well, she's dead. She's 86 years old. Let's not go to any heroic efforts here and run the bills up for the family and make her miserable in the last few moments of her life. So I threw her body in the meat wagon and sent her off to a morgue at a little hospital in Albany, New York. But the house doctor is not going to let you put a body in the morgue without a death certificate. 
So he comes down, examines her again, couldn't find a, a pulse respiration, declares her dead, writes a death certificate, turns her body over to the morgue technician who promptly strips her body down, hoses her down with water to clean her up, puts her in a body bag, and he wheels her into a freezer for 90 minutes until the pathologist gets there to do the autopsy. An hour and a half in the freezer, the pathologist and coroner show up, so he wheels the body out of the freezer, zips open the body bag, and she sits up. She <laughs> says, thank God you found me. It was cold and dark in there, and I didn't know where I was. Now, she had to be a tough old bird. If you don't believe so, get naked, hose yourself down, and get in the freezer with the ice cream for 90 minutes, <laughs> and see how well you do. About five years ago, all the medical doctors in the world got together at a big international convention. They wanted to do a study and find out what it was that drove certain patients to give up money. You know, when something happened and the, and the doctor tried to settle out of court, wave a $1 million check in front of people's face, $1 million, tax-free. These people say, no, nope, money doesn't matter. I'm going to take this doctor before a jury and show that he's a quack and a fraud and a butcher and all that sort of stuff. They want to know what it was that turned the patient's button on to get him to do that. What they found out was this. It's always a patient who felt slighted when they were in pain or in trouble, and the doctor then did something wrong and hurt them. And this doctor was one who was notorious for coming in the, the examining room. You're laying there in your gown or naked on the, on the couch or the examining table, and um, kept looking at your watch and looked at the record, never touched the patient or shook their hand or talked to them directly in their eyes, but just looked at the record and said, okay, I'm going to write your prescription, ran out the door and calling to his nurse to get his car up because he had a golf appointment. These are the ones that patients just wanted to go after him. And you shouldn't be too surprised that this is the approach that the medical profession has taken to prevent those types of suits. This is from The Lancet, the top British medical journal, the top international medical journal. And it was two professors of medical ethics from the medical school at the University of Western Ontario up in Canada. And what they said was this. Acting classes should be required in medical schools so doctors can learn just when to provide a perfectly timed, compassionate look or a touch on the hand. And that was supposed to avoid all these suits where patients thought the doctors didn't like them. So if you go to a doctor for every little thing, you don't know if they're acting or not. They don't even, you don't even know if they know if you're alive or dead. You don't know if they're gorked out on something or sober. You don't know if they're going to give you one of those 70% of the prescriptions that are going to kill you. These are all reasons why you want to avoid stepping on the landmines. Get as much information as you can yourself. Make as many of your own decisions as you can. Save yourself unnecessary risk. That's concept number one. Concept number two, these are all the positive things that most of you are here for tonight. These are the positive things that you can do to direct yourself towards reaching 120 to 140. And basically what you want to do is give your body all of the raw materials it requires to maintain and repair itself. Most of us don't think in those terms. We require maintenance materials just like any machine, uh, if you will, that a uh, tractor. Can you run a tractor or a car without coolant and oil? No, you wouldn't think of it. And yet, uh, you know, the equivalent, we try to do that for our own bodies. So let's look at what we need to maintain ourselves and repair ourselves. We need 90 essential nutrients, 60, that's 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids and 3 essential fatty acids. And the reason why these things are called essential nutrients is twofold. Number one, our bodies cannot manufacture them. We must consume them every day, either in food or as supplements. And number two, if any one of these essential nutrients is missing for six months, 12 months, a year, two years, guess what happens? You get on the average 10 deficiency diseases. 10 deficiency diseases times 90 essential nutrients that's 900 diseases that are preventable with proper supplementation. And the nice part of this story is, if you've had any of these deficiency diseases for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and you start supplementing because you just learned about this, you have every honest expectation of getting significantly better, maybe even 100% better. So you have everything to gain and nothing to lose by considering this. Now, as we've learned tonight, the media is interested in what you're interested in because it sells newspapers, so to speak. They sell a lot of newspapers if they have a nice story and everybody runs out to get one. If you hear a radio program that everybody's interested in, uh, they sell more advertisement. So this is why you hear a lot of health programs on radio and on TV, and you see it in newspapers and magazines. And my personal favorite of all the health articles was this one here, April 6, 1992, a little over four years ago. 
It was the first time that the subject of vitamins and minerals was treated in a positive way by any mainstream publication, Time Magazine no less, cover. It says, the real power of vitamins. New research shows they may help fight cancer, heart disease, and the ravages of aging. Prior to this article, mainstream magazines would only say things like, well, vitamins and minerals are quackery and hoax and fraud, charlatanism. Nobody needs those things. You can get everything you need from your four food groups. Now, if you haven't read that article, again, April 6, 1992, I'd urge you to go to a library, public library, school library, dig it out and read it. There were six positive pages. There was only one negative sentence, and as you might guess, it was offered by a medical doctor who was asked by the writer of the article, what do you think about vitamins and minerals for human nutrition? Here's what he said, quote, Popping vitamins doesn't do any good, sniffs Dr. Victor Herbert, a professor of medicine at New York City's Mount Sinai Medical School. We get all the vitamins we need in our diets, and taking supplements just gives you expensive urine, unquote. Now, Missouri translation of that is you're just peeing away your money. <laughs> might as well wad up your dollars and throw them in the toilet and flush them away. You know, you get everything you need from your four food groups. That little sentence has killed more Americans than all of the foreign enemies with their rifles and artillery put together. You can get everything you need from your four food group. It is not true. Believe me, it's not true now. And I can guarantee you, after having done those 17,500 autopsies and over 454 species of animals, plus 3,000 human beings for a comparison, having practiced for 12 years in Portland, Oregon as a general family practitioner, pushing 60 myself and having kids this tall and grandkids this big and not too distant future great-grandkids, I'd rather pee out 50 cents or a dollar a day worth of excess vitamins and minerals. That's cheap insurance. If you don't invest 50 cents to a dollar a day in yourself, as sure as God made little green apples, you're going to invest in the lifestyle of a medical doctor. Because when you pay them hard cash out of your own pocket or indirectly through insurance or indirectly through taxes and Medicare, not a single penny of that goes to better understand, manage, treat, prevent, or cure catastrophic diseases in kids, breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men, diabetes, heart disease, cataracts. It pays the doctor's mortgage. It pays the doctor's mortgage. No matter how you're struggling with your bills, it pays the doctor's mortgage. And when you pay the doctor after the second week of the month, you're paying his Mercedes payment. You pay the doctor after the third week of the month, you're paying the tuition for their kids to go to medical school at Harvard. Or worse yet, Yale Law School. So all you need is a bunch more Yale lawyers running around. We got a whole White House full of them, and look what's going on in there. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we could get into that. I mean, that's why they call me the Rush Limbaugh of alternative health. <laughs> okay. Now, one of the things that I used to do for my patients was send them a two-cent photocopy of little articles I'd find in newspapers and nutritional journals and medical and veterinary journals, things that they could do themselves nutritionally or with herbs or whatnot. And uh, it got to be quite a thing. 250,000 people a month wanted these two-cent photocopies. So I turned it into a magazine that comes out every couple of months. But I'm going to show you what I used to give my patients and what you two can, can get. Um, let's start out with cancer, the number two killer of uh, adults in the United States. If you take nothing else home tonight but this piece of information, it was worth your coming. This little study was done by the National Cancer Institute. And they went to Henan Province, China for five years. And they chose Henan Province, China because it has the highest rate of cancer and cancer deaths in the whole world. They took 29,000 apparently healthy people, ranging in age from 40 to 69, and they divided them up into little groups and gave each group a different vitamin, different mineral, sometimes combinations of vitamins and minerals. And after five years, they untangled the study, and here's what they found. If you got a single nutrient, not much positive happened when it came to reducing the death rate from cancer. And not too surprising, vitamin C didn't do much by itself. Linus Pauling took 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day for 35 years, still died of cancer. Retinol or vitamin A didn't work. Zinc, riboflavin, the trace mineral molybdenum, niacin, none of these things worked as single nutrients. But one group showed significant benefit. They took three nutrients, double the American RDA, I mean a pitifully low dose, double the American RDA, 20 cents a day, beta carotene, vitamin E, and the trace mineral selenium, and they showed a reduction in deaths from all causes by 9%. This included suicide and pneumonia and car wrecks and cancer and diabetes and heart disease and aneurysms and whatnot reduced deaths from all causes by 9%. They reduced all cancers, regardless of the type of cancer, by 13%. And the type of cancer most prevalent in Henan province, stomach and lower esophageal cancer, they reduced by 21%. Saved almost one out of four simply by taking in three nutrients, beta-carotene, vitamin E, and selenium. 
Now, don't wait for your doctor or your government to give you this information. If they haven't already yelled at you or sent you an urgent healthogram or had their nurse call you, they're not going to do it. I mean, we're talking, this was two and a half years ago. So that uh, you need to just take the bull by the horns and do it yourself. Now, my very favorite disease, and I call it my favorite disease, if you can have such a thing as a favorite disease, is arthritis. And the reason why I like arthritis, it very clearly shows people what they can do for themselves. And once you get enough confidence in dealing with a disease, you say, well, gosh, maybe I can be this good working with another one and so on. And so it kind of gives you that confidence you need to make some decisions on your own without having to ask a doctor for everything. Now, there's not a single medical treatment designed to fix arthritis, yet 75% of all Americans over the age of 50 get it to one kind or one degree or another. And according to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, over the next 7 to 10 years, 35 million baby boomers, of whom there's quite a few in this room, are going to get it. And there's not a single medical treatment designed to fix it. By contrast, in veterinary medicine, we're encouraged to find nutritional formulas that are designed to, to prevent and cure all kinds of diseases in animals, including arthritis. So the advantage my patients had was, I'm a veterinarian as well as a physician, so I went into my veterinary background and I took all these uh, veterinary formulas designed to prevent and cure arthritis in, in chickens and turkeys and pheasants and pigeons and dogs and cats and sheep and pigs and horses and cows and lions and tigers and bears and, uh, d and adapted them to human use. And I came up with what I called Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula. Not because there's any pigs in there, but because it was uh, used to prevent and cure arthritis in pigs. Now, this little formula, over the last 20 plus years, I have literally seen regrow cartilage and bone in literally tens of thousands of people. Right now, there's over a quarter of a million people a month using Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula, and it's going up at a rate of three to 4,000 new people a month. And the reason is, of course, it works. Now, the medical profession would differ with this. They'd say, now, Wallach, that's absolutely not true. Everybody knows you can't regrow cartilage and bone. When you have bone-to-bone -bone arthritis, the only thing left for you medically is to have joint replacement surgery. And I'd have to agree with them, I'd have to agree with them uh, that if the only raw materials you're using is aspirin and Tylenol and gold shots and methotrexate and prednisone and cortisone, you're not going to regrow cartilage and bone because those are not the raw materials to do it. Me they have many, many side effects, many of which are fatal. And when these things over the counter and prescription medications don't work anymore to relieve pain and inflammation, the only thing left for you medically is joint replacement surgery. And these procedures are all directed towards relieving pain. I mean, it's such a terrible, painful disease that people are willing to let surgeons cut out their knees and their hips and their shoulders in any attempt to relieve pain. So I came up with Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula. Well, Harvard Medical School has laid in the bushes for me for 25 years, and they said, ha, we've finally found a way to, to prove that Wallach is a quack and a fraud and a charlatan because everybody knows you can't regrow cartilage and bone. And they took what they thought was the most ridiculous one-third of Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula and they gave it to 29 patients who had failed to respond in any way to heroic medical treatment for arthritis over 15 to 20 years. They took them off all their medication, wasn't doing them any good anyway, and the only thing left for them medically was joint replacement surgery. And they gave them a heaping tablespoon full of ground up chicken cartilage and orange juice every morning for 90 days, just three short months. And here's what happened. After 10 days, they had complete relief of pain and inflammation, something they hadn't had in 15 to 20 years. In 30 days, they could now open up a new pickle jar that never had been opened without pain to the fingers, wrist, elbows, and shoulder. And in 90 days, just three months, according to Harvard Medical School, not me, 28 of the 29 were clinically cured. Now, you'd think they'd call me up and say, Wallach, we've got to apologize to you. Hey, next time you come to Boston, come on in, we'll buy you a lobster dinner. You know, because, uh, gosh, even the most ridiculous one-third of your pig arthritis formula did some good. That's not what happened. Don't be too surprised. Here's what the medical director, the guy who's a professor of, of medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston, here's what he said, quote, after three months it was clear that the drug was beneficial, unquote. Chicken cartilage had become a drug in 90 days. <laughs> now why would you think that would happen? Well, bec because you can't patent chicken cartilage. So they went out to the U.S. Patent Office and they got a use patent on chicken cartilage. And you two now for 3,500 bucks a month can get Harvard Medical School's Chicken cartilage in a capsule, arthritis cure. 3500 bucks a month. So if this sounds a little pricey to you, all you have to do is go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, buy a $5 bucket of chicken, throw away the meat, and eat the ends off the bones. It's the same stuff. <laughs> now, if you have several people in your family, that could get a little pricey, you know, if you have arthritis. So what you want to do then is go to the dumpster behind the KFC in the dark of the night. <laughs> Take your kids or your grandkids 
give him an empty five-gallon feed bucket, put him in that dumpster, let him scoop out the bones for you, and take him home, put those bones on a cookie sheet, put them in an oven, bake them dry, pound them into a flour with your own ball-peen hammer, and then fill those chicken, car or, you know, those capsules yourself. And you just don't want to let anybody know what you're doing because if the word gets out, you know, Francine is making chicken cartilage caps, she's curing everybody in the neighborhood of arthritis, the FDA is going to come arrest you in your house for manufacturing a patented drug. <laughs> or worse yet, they'll send Janet to save you from yourself and she'll burn your house down. <laughs> so if you want to avoid all these legal entanglements and you don't want to get all those gushy chicken bones all over your house, all you have to do is uh, go to a good grocery store and get yourself uh, um, some either Knox gelatin or Willamette Valley gelatin. Unflavored and unsweetened is the same stuff as the chondroitin sulfate in there, which is the basic building block to rebuild cartilage and uh, bone, bone matrix, bone foundation. If your neck sounds like a bag full of gravel, you got low back problems, loose teeth, and all those kinds of things, I'm going to give Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula a try, and I'll give you the full formula at the end. Another one of my favorite diseases is Alzheimer's disease. It's a physician-caused disease. It's a pretty powerful statement. It's a physician-caused disease. We didn't have Alzheimer's disease 40 years ago. It was not in any medical dictionary, medical textbooks. It was not taught in any medical class. It only became a disease entity in 1979. Today, according to Ralph Nader, it rivals cancer and costs $300,000 per patient, and it's the number four killer of adults over the age of 65 behind cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, then comes Alzheimer's disease. Now, we eliminated Alzheimer's disease from animals some 40 years ago. Can you imagine a dairy farmer with 400 hundred head of cows out in the pasture with Alzheimer's disease? And he's yelling at them, you know, woo! And rattling the feed bucket, trying to get them up to get milk. And the cows are all out there scratching their heads saying, why do we want to go to the barn to get milk? <laughs> and if we did, where's the barn? Because they get kind of, you know. <laughs> So the farmer has to put fuel in the ATV and ride out there and herd them up in the... You know, fuel cost goes up, labor cost goes up, so they have to raise the price of milk. Nobody's happy. So we eliminated Alzheimer's disease by eliminating vegetable oil, corn oil, and soil from the animal's diet and putting in large doses of vitamin E and selenium. Well, this is one of those two-cent photocopies you should have gotten from your doctors three and a half years ago, almost four years ago now. This is not from the National Enquirer. This is from the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, a very reputable research institution. And they said, vitamin E can ease memory loss in Alzheimer's patients. And I don't know how many of you saw that little article, and I'm waiting to get a copy of it so I can make another overhead. Just last week, from uh, one of the English universities, and it came out and said, yeah, people take in 800 units of vitamin E every day. The odds of them getting a heart attack or Alzheimer's disease is almost zero. Alzheimer's disease is an American disease. It does not occur in third world countries. It does not occur in Europe. It's an American disease. That's because all our doctors, well, I'll tell you in a minute. I'll prove it to you in a minute. But it's a physician-caused disease. How many of you heard, whether you believe it or not, that vegetable oils are healthier for you than a terrible saturated animal fat? Whether you believe it or not, raise your hand if you've heard it. That's pretty good, about 50%. The other half of you are either asleep, lying, or have Alzheimer's because I know you've heard it. <laughs> Now, we learned 50 years ago in the animal industry that, that vegetable oils were bad for you because we tried to get animals to gain weight faster by giving them 20% and 40% of the ration as corn oil or soil because it has double the amount of calories as does cracked corn. Oils have nine calories per gram and uh, carbohydrate uh, type calories from either uh, beet pulp or, or cracked corn has something like four and a half calories per gram. And sure enough, for the first couple of weeks that animals were on the oils, they gained weight many times faster than ones just getting carbohydrate calories. But in six weeks, they all died of heart attacks. So we knew it was a good idea that went bad somewhere. And they said, well, what do we do with this stuff? No farmer is dumb enough to give it to his livestock anymore. They said, look, we've contracted with farmers to grow millions of tons of corn oil and soil every year for the next 50 years. What do we do with this stuff? They said, well, it's not proven in human beings yet that it's dangerous. Let's convince people that vegetable oil is good for them. And they've done a pretty good job over the last 35, 40 years, haven't they? All you got to do is go into the dairy case. I mean, this is really blatant. You go to the dairy case in the grocery store and you find 85 brands of corn oil margarine in the dairy case. That's how much they brainwash people. You should have gotten this information three and a half years ago. Vegetable oils can cause heart disease. It's a nightmare, said Dr. Edward Emkin, a specialist in food oils for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And it's really a nasty thing when you try to explain it. There's now total confusion for consumers. Why would there be total confusion for consumers? Well, that's because the truth is different from what you've been taught for 35 years. Here's another look at the same problem. Margarine can uh, increase your risk of heart attacks. 
A lot of people say to me, well, I've got a whole freezer full of tub margarine. Can I use that? <laughs> tub margarine, stick margarine, doesn't matter. It's the same thing. <laughs> this was what they called the Harvard Nurses Health Study, and they took 90,000 nurses over 20 years, divided them into two groups, put one group on margarine as their spread for their crackers and bread and cooking sharpening, put the other 45,000 nurses on butter for their spread and their crackers and bread and cooking sharpening, at the end of the 20 years, they looked at their death certificates, and for every 100 nurses who had died of a heart attack, 70 of them were in the margarine group. You have a two and a half times greater risk of dying of a heart attack if you use margarine than butter. Now, the biggest fraud ever perpetuated against the American people, the biggest fraud ever perpetuated against the American people is this cholesterol thing. And this is one of those two cent photocopies you should have got from your doctors three and a half years ago. Top researchers reluctantly admit that low levels of cholesterol are bad for you. Low levels of cholesterol are worse for you than high levels of cholesterol. This is from the University of California at San Francisco, a researcher who is renowned as the top, the top medical researcher on cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. His name is Stephen B. Hulley. Here's another look at the same study three and a half years ago. Here's what he said, quote, what it comes down to is there's an extraordinary set of observations that have emerged this year because for the first time we have a large enough study to really see them. What he said there was, for 40 years we've been giving you caca. <laughs> you know, the stuff that's in baby diapers. And um, <laughs> we didn't really know the truth about cholesterol, so we made stuff up. Just we thought it was good for us, so we made stuff up. But now, after 20 years, we finally have the truth. Now, why on this God's green earth would anybody want to have a blood cholesterol below 180? Always because a doctor instructed you or ordered you to do it. Now, about seven years ago, actually it was May 1st, seven years ago, I began lecturing 300 nights out of each year, like this, all across the country. And in the beginning, the crowds were just three people. Then it was 20, and then 50, and then 100. And for the last five years, it's been hundreds. And the, the interest is growing and people doing things for themselves. And my wife said, look, I'll support you out in the field if you want to do that for seven to ten years. But it's going to, you know, it's going to take a lot of, of toll on you, eating hotel food and having weird hours and driving all night to get from one place to another. What I want you to do, if you're going to do this, is to have yourself a hobby. And every time you feel yourself really getting so warped out that they're going to come after you with a butterfly net or a straight racket, study this hobby and get yourself calmed down before you get it in front of an audience. I said, well, that, that's good advice. I'll do that. But after the hundreds of different things I looked at, I settled on collecting obituaries of medical doctors <laughs> as my hobby. Now, the reason was, of course, it's a very useful piece of information. If doctors knew what they were talking about when it came to health and longevity, if you separate them out from the rest of the American population, they should be healthier and live longer than anybody else. And boy, was I surprised. I started out 100 years ago, June 15, 1895, in JAMA, which is the premier medical journal in the world, actually, Journal of the American Medical Association. And they did a survey 100 years ago on deaths in American doctors. What they found out, the average lifespan of medical doctors 100 years ago was 54.6. 54.6. The average population in America, the average lifespan was 62. Now, they were in trouble then. A hundred years later, January of 1993, I redid the study using obituaries from the Journal of American Medical Association, just like they did originally. And guess what? The average lifespan for medical doctors today is 57.6. And I gave them the benefit of the doubt and rounded it up to 58. The average lifespan for the average American is 75.5. You gain almost 20 years statistically by not going to medical school. <laughs> so I brought you a few of my favorites so you can see what fun I'm having. And of course, all of these are physicians who have died of nutritional deficiency diseases. Um, Stuart Cartwright, age 38, was a family practitioner. Good looking kid. I'm sure he could have been a movie actor if he wanted to. I promise you he married the prom queen and uh, he probably had a Mercedes convertible in Southern California, probably never repaid a student loan, all the things that medical students put on their list of, of uh, wishes. And he dropped dead in his home from a ruptured coronary artery aneurysm. And the fascinating thing to me is this is something we learned in Turkey's in, in the 50s, 1957, how to prevent and in the early stages reverse aneurysms. And of course, this was from a study of 250,000 turkeys the USDA put on a complete turkey pellet trying to get these turkeys to finish for market within a week or two of each other as opposed to strung out all over the whole summer uh, when they're on pasture. And in the first 13 weeks, fully half of them, 125,000 of them died. Farmers were out there every morning picking them up with a bushel basket full, took them into the state diagnostic lab to see what they died from. And when they cut them open at autopsy, every one of them had died of a ruptured aortic aneurysm. 
And one of the clever pathologists says, ah, that's got to be due to a copper deficiency because everybody knows that the elastic fibers and arteries and skin and other tissues require a large amount of copper to be manufactured. And the mechanism of an aneurysm is identical to the mechanism of a balloon on the weakened wall of a tire. You know when you hit a chuck hole and you break the cords in a tire, the internal pressure on the tire blows a balloon and you thump down the highway and heat it up, it'll blow. Same way with an aneurysm. When you get a breakdown of those elastic fibers, the internal pressure in an artery, even normal blood pressure will blow a balloon, it's called an aneurysm, and if it ruptures, you bleed to death. So they got excited about this. They doubled the amount of copper in those pellets. The next year they tried to raise 500,000 turkeys and they did not lose a single one from a ruptured aneurysm. They went from a 50% loss to a 0% loss simply by adding a little copper and they got all excited about this and they started looking at copper deficient diets and copper levels in human blood and tissues and what they came up with was this. The very first symptom of copper deficiency in human beings is white, gray, or silver hair. I see a lot of copper deficiency in this room tonight. Okay, and of course you don't want to be like a medical doctor and just color your hair because you know that's treating the symptom but not obviously getting down to the root cause of things. And if you don't take action at this point and uh, don't give yourself some of the right type of copper, what's going to happen is you start getting a breakdown of the elastic fibers in your skin and you get crow's feet around the corners of your eyes and your mouth. Parts of your anatomy begin to sag and you know you're in trouble when you go to your doctor and he says, you know, I've got a golf buddy down the hall who's a plastic surgeon for $10,000. He'll make you look 20 years younger. But you don't need a booby lift, a tummy tuck, or a derriere lift, or a facial lift. All you need is some colloidal copper and everything will come back up just like you have a hydraulic jack under it. Now, if you don't take action at that point, you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in the large veins of your legs and you get varicose veins. If you don't take action at this point, you get a breakdown of the elastic fibers in the large veins of your exhaust pipe and you get hemorrhoids. So, if you, <laughs> if you have hemorrhoids, varicose veins, things that sag, wrinkles, white, gray, or silver hair, the odds are you have aneurysms developing in you somewhere. And don't be like old Frank who dies suddenly of a ruptured aneurysm and all his friends get together at Denny's after the funeral and eating some of that famous blueberry cheesecake and they say, we never thought Frank would be the first one to go. I mean, he was Mr. Fitness. This guy walked five miles before breakfast every morning. He ripped the chicken skin off the chicken before he ate it, took an aspirin every day. He went to the health club every night and did those water aerobics with the young people. And he always looked so distinguished in his gray hair. His body had been screaming at him for 25 years. Frank, give me some copper. Frank, give me some copper. And he just stood in the mirror and said, man, I look like Einstein. You know, my gray hair. What did Einstein die from? A ruptured aortic aneurysm. What color was Einstein's hair? Snow white. Now this fellow here, Dr. Michael P. Ortiz, 38 years old, also 20 years before the average for physicians and 40 years before the average American. He was a jogger. Dr. Michael P. Ortiz was a jogger, 38 years old, and he encouraged his well patients to jog with him. He gave him a 10% discount on his services if they would jog with him a minimum of 15 days out of each month. So he had this big groupy thing every day that all these patients were jogging with him because they wanted this 10% discount in his services. Well, he collapsed and died in front of his horrified patients while they were jogging <laughs> of a simple cardiomyopathy heart attack, a selenium deficiency. And because they didn't want to give up that 10% discount on the services, they all kept jogging. Nobody stopped to give them any CPR. <laughs> Dr. Martin Carter, age 57, one year before the average for physicians, and uh, 20 years before the average American, was an expert, according to the New York Times obituaries. <clears throat> this guy had every drop of medical education you could get in the whole world. But he didn't have expensive urine. So he didn't have expensive urine. Even though his mom and dad were proud of him, the cause of death was a ruptured aortic aneurysm, just like those copper deficient turkeys. This is my mother's favorite obituary. She found it. I have to use it all the time to keep mom happy. This was, what, two, almost three years ago now, July of 93. Dr. Gail Clark, age 47, was the chief cardiologist at her hospital. She's walking down the halls of her hospital with a stethoscope around her neck. She drops dead. And let's say you're a heart patient in the ICU and your monitor shows you're stable. Beep, 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 beep. And then you hear them, you know, they close the curtain next to you. You don't know it's your doctor being brought in there. You hear them cut the clothes off and they're yelling for the code carts and the paddles and contact gel and they need some bicarb and some... Um, um, epinephrine and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and then you hear him say, okay, clear everybody, here we go. Contact. <coughs> Didn't work. Okay, we need to turn the paddles up. More gel, more contact gel. Clear, clear, here we go. <coughs> then they turn on the monitor. 
flat line, so you know she's dead. You say, nurse. Now your monitor's going, beep, 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 because you're nervous. <clears throat> say, nurse, nurse, what, what went down next door? Sound awful with all the screaming and code cards. And the nurse says, you know, your cardiologist, the chief cardiologist of this hospital, Dr. Gail Clark, age 47, just croaked next door from a cardiomyopathy heart attack, a simple selenium deficiency disease. And you see all the patients holding their gowns. And they're running out of the hospital <laughs> as fast as they can go because whatever the chief got, they don't want. I mean, if it kills the chief, and you don't, <laughs> why would you want it? Dr. George Kohler, the youngest person ever to win the Nobel Prize in Medicine. He's in the 20th century. Dr. George Kohler, 37 years old, wins the Nobel Prize in Medicine for his uh, work with antibodies, monoclonal antibodies. He's going to save people from cancer, which is a righteous type of research. 11 years later, age 48, boom, drops dead from a cardiomyopathy heart attack, a simple selenium deficiency disease, because he believed you could get everything you needed from your four food groups. I remember I told you when I came back from Africa, I was supposed to find an early warning system, and it turned out that the early warning system is not a wombat or a koala bear or a ruby-throated hummingbird or a rare and endangered fish or reptile. It turns out that our early warning system is our own young athletes. According to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, 100,000 young athletes under the age of 30 drop dead each year during exercise or a game or immediately after exercise or a game. 100,000. Double the number who were killed in car accidents. Ten years ago, I began to see articles like this in medical journals. Sudden death in young athletes. And this is a small study, but it gives you a flavor of what's going on here. 29 highly conditioned competitive athletes ages 13 to 30 dropped dead during a game in this study. 35% of them died of ruptured aneurysms, a copper deficiency. The other 65% died of cardiomyopathy, heart disease, a selenium deficiency. Now, what do you think is the most dangerous sport in the world? You can yell them out to me. Basketball. Boxing. Basketball. Basketball. Hockey. Football. Jogging. Cross-country racing. It turns out that it is basketball. 45% or 45,000 out of the 100,000 are basketball players. And I'll show you why in a minute. Football happens to be second. Here's some of the faces of the young Americans. These are, you know, the, the, the pride of America. These are kids who are healthy, apparently, and just suddenly drop dead during games. 14, 15, 16, 18 years old. Here's a water polo player, 14 years old, cardiomyopathy, heart disease. Fifteen years old, Stanley Hawkins, freshman in high school, just practicing basketball, drops over dead from a cardiomyopathy heart attack, selenium deficiency. Darren Mallott, 22 years old, six foot five, had just signed a multi-million dollar contract with an NBA team, just shooting some baskets, and it wasn't even a game. He was in his jeans, his t-shirt, just shooting some baskets, went for a layup, put the ball in the basket, came down, he was dead. Cardiomyopathy heart attack, selenium deficiency. Here's one that's a little more famous, Reggie Lewis, 27-year-old captain of the Boston Celtics, April of 1993, a little over three years ago now. Collapsed uh, during a playoff game with the Charlotte Hornets and was diagnosed very accurately and very quickly as having cardiomyopathy heart disease. And because he was a $65 million contract athlete, the Celtics hired the top 12 cardiologists in the whole world and referred to this collection of doctors which they accumulated in Boston as the dream team of cardiologists. They called them the dream team of cardiologists, gave them a million bucks each to refer all their patients out to other doctors, and lo and behold, lo and behold, um, they were supposed to devote their full time to saving Reggie. They didn't take 50 bucks of their money and give it to a medical student or pre-med student to go to the medical library and, and like Star Trek, ask the computer, computer, what are all the known causes of cardiomyopathy? If they would have done that, the computer would have said, there's only one known cause of cardiomyopathy. It was discovered in animals in 1957, and the disease was eliminated from animals in 1958. It was proven in human beings in 1972 with a double-blind crossover study with 45,000 human subjects, and the disease was eliminated in the country in which this was done. The only known cause of cardiomyopathy heart disease in both animals and human beings is a deficiency of the trace mineral selenium. They didn't do that, and as a result, they didn't give Reggie Lewis 10 cents a day worth of selenium. If they would have done that, Reggie Lewis would still be alive today. And as a result, while they were bickering, three months after his initial heart attack, Reggie Lewis, 27 years old, July 28, 1993, dies of a second cardiomyopathy heart attack. Now, 
If the dream team of cardiologists wouldn't give a $65 million athlete 10 cents a day worth of selenium, what's the chances of your cardiologist giving you any? Well, watch my lips if you haven't gotten it by now. None. Okay. I think you get the picture. Now, if you wait long enough, if you wait long enough, justice has a way of coming around, doesn't it? You know my hobby, so you shouldn't be too surprised that a year and a half after Reggie Lewis died, the chief of the dream team of cardiologists, one Dr. W. Thomas Nessa, a marathon runner, finished the Boston Marathon three times before he died, was the vice chairman of the Department of Cardiology at Havitt Medical School, age 48, boom, drops dead from a cardiomyopathy heart attack. Dr. W. Thomas Nessa, a member of the dream team of cardiologists, who treated the late Boston Celtics captain Reggie Lewis, died in his own home of the same thing. I mean, this guy had to be malignant dumb, right? I mean, he didn't learn anything from a $65 million autopsy. November 1995, Sergey Grinkoff, two-time gold medal winner of uh, Paris figure skating, 1988 and 1994 in, in the Olympic Games, was just tying a skates, was just tying a skates at Lake Placid, New York, getting ready to get into peak uh, physical condition for his uh, upcoming Olympics. Drops over dead, age 28, from cardiomyopathy, heart attack, just like Reggie Lewis, age 27. Here's one Matt LaChapa, backup uh, pitcher, San Diego Padres, 20 years old, collapsed and died from cardiomyopathy, heart attack. Here's a good story. Evander Holyfield. Evander Holyfield was banned almost three years ago now from boxing because he developed cardiomyopathy, heart disease. Not the sudden type that kills you instantly, but uh, slow wasting of the heart muscle, kind of a muscular dystrophy of the heart muscle. He was banned from boxing because he couldn't pass the physical anymore. And about seven months into his retirement, I ran into one of his physicians in a seminar like this in Atlanta. We talked about the relationship between selenium deficiency and cardiomyopathy, heart disease, and they began to give Evander Holyfield some selenium. Ten months later, his electrocardiogram goes to normal, and he passes the physical the Boxing Commission, something that never happens. People with cardiomyopathy, heart disease, never go back to normal. But, but then all they get is pacemakers and heart transplants. So at any rate, he passes a physical. He boxes about a year ago, wins his first fight back in the ring. Three months later, he passes a physical again, loses the fight. But then about, uh, I don't know, six, eight weeks ago, passes a physical again. Four weeks ago, he fought again and won the fight. And he's going strong now, simply because he took some minerals here, selenium. If you get into this situation, don't let your doctor tell you you only have two choices, either Kevorkian or the heart transplant. <laughs> you have a third choice, and now you're informed about this, so you can make that decision on your own. The rate of brain cancer in America has gone up 400% in the last 40 years, and everybody's pointing their fingers towards cellular telephones. And everybody's trying to give me a cellular telephone, so I started examining this. Was there anything to that? And you don't have to worry about it if you use them because 97% of the people who use cellular telephone, or excuse me, 97% of the people with brain cancer have never even been in the same room with a cellular telephone, let alone use one. So you don't have to worry about that. But there is a little known trace mineral known as gallium. This trace mineral gallium, G-A-L-L-I-U-M, when you give it to laboratory animals in optimal amounts and then you give them a chemical known to cause brain cancer, they don't get it. If you give them a laboratory experimental diet that's deficient in gallium and then give them the same chemical, they all get brain cancer. So I believe this huge increase in, in rate of brain cancer in America is a combination of a gallium deficiency and a lot of chemicals in our air, water, and food that do cause brain cancer. Think about all the performers who die suddenly, um, who, whose performances are almost athletic in their presentation. People like Elvis, he died of cardiomyopathy, heart disease. And because he had lots of drugs in his blood and his liver, they blamed his death on the drugs. But he really died of cardiomyopathy heart disease, which is a selenium deficiency disease. Then you look at Conway Twitty, who died in front of 3,000 fans in uh, Branson, Missouri, with a ruptured aortic aneurysm, a copper deficiency. You look at Michael Jackson, collapsed in December of 1995 and was in the intensive care unit for one week because his blood minerals and electrolytes were all messed up, almost died. When you go to a basketball game, a football game, a track meet, look out there at those well-trained athletes. The odds are all the couch potatoes in the stands and bleachers have a much better chance of living to be over 80 than those athletes do. And here I'll put out my challenge. If you can find me an obituary of any university semi-pro or pro athlete who's lived to be over 100, I'll give you a $100 bill. 
because I've looked real hard. The average lifespan for athletes, both university and semi-pro and professional, is 62 to 65, depending on their sport. Here's the final clue. As many as 62% of the female college gymnasts suffer from anorexia. They suffer from anorexia, 62%. Is that because it's genetic? No. Is that because all their mothers hate them? No. Is that because they think they're too fat? Absolutely not. I used to see a lot of these gals in the 70s and 80s when I practiced up in Portland, Oregon, because that was the time of Olga Corbett. And you may remember her as being the darling of the world because um, um, she'd won every gymnastic event in the Olympics in the same Olympiad with a perfect score, and everybody wanted their little girl to be an Olga Corbett. And I used to see them, they'd get split lips and fractured and dislocations because they, you know, they weren't, weren't all perfect, and they'd hit those bars going full speed and, and uh, get dislocations and split lips and twists and sprains and strains and bruises. But the ones that fascinated me were the little 8, 10, 12 years old that were depressed and anorexic, certainly not typical of a teenage girl or preteen girl. And so I used to do hair analysis on them because that was the only way I could communicate with them because they weren't sociable, they wouldn't eat, they didn't want to uh, um, study or they didn't want to do their um, athletics anymore. And sure enough, every one of them were severely deficient in many, many nutrients, 30, 40 nutrients, but all of them were uniformly severely deficient in two trace minerals, zinc and lithium, zinc and lithium. So I began to give them as many as 25 or 30 nutrients intravenously two or three times a week, paying special attention to giving them lots of zinc and lithium. And sure enough, in 14 to 21 days, they were eating like little pigs again. They were real interested in going out and, and training. They were sociable again. And all the parents who took their little girls who were anorexic to counselors and shrinks, those little girls were counseled unto death. Now, you may remember Karen Carpenter from the singing group, the brother, sister, the Carpenters. She was 30 years old, give or take a year or so. She developed anorexia and because they had lots of money. They went around the world and went to all the shrinks and, and the counselors in Moscow and Berlin and London and Paris, all over the United States, and they counseled her unto death. Because you cannot counsel somebody well who has a terminal zinc deficiency. You have to give them some zinc. Now, what possibly could be the common denominator between a 65-pound gymnast, a 7-foot-tall basketball player, 250-pound boxer, heavyweight boxing champion, and these runners that have less than 4% body fat on them, what could possibly be the common denominator? They all sweat. And when you sweat, you sweat out all 60 essential nutrients, all 60 essential minerals. You don't just sweat out, you don't just sweat out potassium and Gatorade, you sweat out all 60 essential minerals. And when you sweat out all of your selenium and don't replace it by supplementation, on the average, you're going to get a cardiomyopathy heart attack. You sweat out all of your copper and don't replace it by supplementation, you're going to get an aneurysm. You sweat out all of your chromium and vanadium, you're going to get diabetes. You sweat out all of your gallium and don't replace it, you're going to get a brain cancer. If you're a teenage girl and you sweat out all of your zinc and your lithium, you're going to get anorexia. Get the picture? Now, the reason why athletes are early warning system, as a rule, they sweat out more in 20 to 30 years than a couch potato does in 80 years. They've compressed a whole lifetime of sweating into 20 years. That's why they're our early warning system. Now, you don't have to be an athlete to sweat, though. Let's say you're a postmenopausal woman and you have night sweats. Let's say you're a welder, a farmer, a carpenter. Let's say you work in the oven room of a pizza hut. Any place that you sweat. Even if you work in a, an office situation where you have an air-conditioned office and you just use a keyboard and it's, you, you never get one bead of sweat on you. I mean, you can go a whole week, wear the same clothes, nobody will know, right? <laughs> but then you go out every night and you do aerobics or you jog and you sweat then. So it doesn't matter why you sweat, whether it's for recreation or at work, if you don't replace those minerals, you're in line, you're putting yourself at high, high risk of developing a lot of these degenerative diseases, many of which are debilitating and certainly many of which are fatal. What's the very first symptom of mineral deficiencies in animals and people? It's called pica and cribbing. Farmers know about this. When they see an animal chewing on the hitching post, and these are a couple of Amish horses up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, when they see them chew, chewing on the hitching post, the fence rails, things like shovel handles, the half doors in the barn, the, the door jams in the barn, a good farmer recognizes this as an animal that's in trouble. They, they, they are minerally deficient. Now, how many of you either are or know of a chocoholic? Raise your hand. Yeah, that's the munchies. That's pike and cribbing. That's a mineral deficiency. It's the only thing that will cause that. How many of you know of a cocaholic or a, or a Pepsi-holic? Raise your hand. Yeah. Oh, a day without 12 Pepsis, I can't function. 
Okay, these are minerally deficient people, and that's one of the reasons why we have a weight challenge in America, because people have been taught to put calories in their mouth instead of minerals. There's no calories in minerals. Next time you have these terrible cravings, instead of putting chips and dips and chocolate and donuts in your mouth, try some minerals. You'll not only lose weight, but you'll feel better and live longer. My favorite mineral is lithium. And the reason why I like lithium is shrinks think it's a drug that only they can prescribe, when in fact it's one of those 60 essential minerals that everybody needs every day. And like all essential nutrients, if it's missing, if it's missing for... Um, six months, nine months, 12 months, a year or so, you get on the average 10 deficiency diseases, which include depression, manic depression, bipolar disease, suicidal behavior, violent behavior, uh, spouse abuse, child abuse, domestic violence, drug addictions, alcohol addictions. These are all symptoms of lithium deficiency and people who've been challenged with sugar, natural or processed. We'll talk more about that in a minute. I believe we should be putting lithium in our drinking water because first of all, it's safer than chlorine and fluorine. And number two, we could eliminate 85% of all domestic violence if we would just put lithium in our drinking water. Now you can pick up and diagnose a child with lithium deficiency and one who's in trouble by looking at their coloring projects. If you look at their coloring projects, if they're deficient in lithium and, and are sensitive to sugar, we'll talk about that in a second, um, these are kids who are going to take a dark color, black, brown, purple, dark red, dark blue, dark green, and scribble all over the page with little or no intent to stay in the lines. These are kids who are in trouble. You can project these four or five-year-olds are going to drop out of high school. They're not going to learn how to write, read, or do math. Uh, they're going to have a, a lousy personal life. They're never going to be happy during a marriage. They're going to be violent types and so forth. These are kids who are in trouble. They're going to experiment with cigarettes and alcohol and drugs. But they're salvageable because this is the same kid here six weeks later, simply getting them off of sugar, natural and processed. No apple juice, no grape juice, no honey, no molasses, no Pepsis, no um, chocolate, no ding-dongs, no sugar-frosted flakes and that sort of thing. And um, supplemented them, this kid, with lithium, chromium, and vanadium. Look at the heels and the boots, and the boots, the glove, the uniform sleeve, the glove, the border on the foot, and the border on the hat and so forth, all in the lines, the tail and so on and with more appropriate colors. You can save these kids if you just pay attention. It's not they don't just have an art aptitude, they're in trouble, okay? Now, if these kids also wet the bed far after they're supposed to be potty trained, they're six, eight, 10, 12, 14 years old and they wet the bed, um, they have a history of scribbling all over the page without staying in the lines, they are cruel to little animals and other kids, and they love to play with matches and fire. These are kids who, if you don't save them at this early age, you can project they're gonna become mass murders and serial killers. It just happens that way. Here's what happens next. You start getting kids with what's called geographic tongues. Geographic tongues are red, pulpy, and painful. They have ulcers and erosions all over their tongues. These kids have zero brain waves. They can't learn how to read, write, and do math. Uh, if you don't take care of them there, they're going to drop out of school and experiment with cigarettes, alcohol, and drugs. When they hit 12, 14, 16 years old, <clears throat> look at the allergic shiners under this kid's eyes. This is not physical abuse, he's just sensitive to sugar. And people are sensitive to sugar just like some people are sensitive to alcohol. You know, there's a good alcoholic, a person who will drink a beer and a shot of whiskey, they'll go to sleep. These are, quote, good alcoholics. There's people who drink a beer, maybe have a shot of whiskey, and they get boisterous and obnoxious, and they start singing loud songs and being loud, and they think jokes are funny that aren't funny. And then you get people who drink, and they just get mean, and... Um, uh, become downright dangerous to themselves and everybody else. The same thing is true with sugar. There are some people who take in sugar and they get low blood sugar and they just go to sleep. Some people who get uh, take in sugar, they get rowdy and uh, attention deficit disorder, ADHD, hyperactivity, learning disabilities, and they get kind of obnoxious. And then there are people who take in sugar and they become serial killers and they get violent. And so people are sensitive to sugar just like they are to alcohol. And you get them off of sugar, natural and processed, and supplement them with lithium, chromium, and vanadium. You can save them and everybody around them. Here's a 20-year-old. You don't need to be a clinical psychologist to see that he's depressed. Look at the allergic shiners under his eyes. And these are the type of kids who live on Pepsis and ding-dongs their whole life. And they're quiet. They stay in their rooms, they wear their headsets, and they listen to their music, or they might play on the keyboards or their computers. And then one day when grandma gives them an irritation of about a 0 0.1 on the scale of 1 to 10, you got to do the dishes before I give you the car keys. They'll walk into the kitchen, pick up the cleaver, and smack grandma's head off. They'll respond with a 10, right? And they're just irritated, 0 0.1. Now, 
This is all too common. Right now, experts say that 30% of all American teenagers are going to appear in juvenile court in 1996. One third of all American teenagers. At any rate, it's a terrible tragedy, but these things do go on all the time. And uh, back, I guess it was the third week in, in January of this year, 1996, I was up in Moses Lake, Washington on a Monday night, actually giving a seminar like this. And when I got to this point, the guys in the front row said, Doc, you don't have to talk about teen violence in Moses Lake. I mean, there's more people in this uh, National Guard armory than there is in the whole town. And we only have a couple hundred teenagers, and they all know each other by first name. It's kind of like a big family. And they didn't believe they had any teen problems in Moses Lake. Well, that was Monday night. Friday at 2 in the afternoon, an honor student in junior high school walks in with his deer rifle, blows away the math teacher and two of his fellow students. Now, this kid was not on drugs. He was not a member of any gang. There's no drugs and gangs in Moses Lake, Washington. You know the answer to why this happened. I'm going to bring it out of you. What time of the year is there more domestic violence, depression, and suicide than any other time of year? Christmas. Holidays. A week before Christmas, Christmas, the time between Christmas and New Year's, from New Year's until now, Super Bowl Day. In fact, Super Bowl Day has the largest number of violent incidents than any other day of the year, Super Bowl Day. What happens during these holidays that happens more than any other time of year? Sugar. I heard people say it. Sugar. You get more cake, more pie, more candy, more cookies, more punch, more colas and drinks of various kinds than you get any other time of year. It's not just on Sunday afternoon. I mean, we're talking four times a day, in school, after school, in the evening, four times or ten times on the weekend because it's party time during the holidays. And as a result, the people who are sensitive to sugar and are going to get violent are depressed come out during this time, especially if they're deficient in lithium, chromium, and vanadium. Attention deficit disorder. Another one of those physician-caused diseases because physicians say sugar is okay. It's better to have Ritalin than sugar. You can have both. You know, if you're good, you can have sugar and Ritalin. <clears throat> well, if you take someone who has ADD or ADHD, attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, regardless of age, whether they're 2 or 6 or 8 or 15 or 25 or 40, and take them off of all sugar, natural and processed, and supplement them with all 90 nutrients, paying special attention to make sure that they get lithium, chromium, and vanadium. 98%, I can't use the cure word, but 98% will get 100% better. Now, the whole family has to do the same thing. You can't be guzzling Cokes and eating donuts and expect a 6-year-old or an 18-year-old to give it up. The whole family has to change and eat the same way for the benefit not only of that child, but for the whole family, because if something goes wrong, the whole family is in trouble. Now, this little gal here, 300 years ago, would have been a vampire or a werewolf, and her own villagers would have burned her to death at the stake. Maybe the village elders would have killed her by driving a wooden stake through her heart. You may remember her as Susan Smith, the mother who drowned her two sons from uh, Union, South Carolina. <clears throat> and uh, we learned a lot about her during her trial. Number one, she tried to commit suicide twice during high school. <clears throat> a lithium and chromium deficiency. Nobody said to her, Susan... Give up all sugar, natural, and processed. We're going to give you some lithium, chromium, and vanadium. They didn't even give her any Prozac. All they did was give her a hug and say, Susan, everybody loves you, and if you get depressed again, let everybody know, and we'll talk you out of this suicide thing. Two years after graduating high school, she went further into her depression. They diagnosed her as being a manic depressive, and they put her on Prozac at that time. Nobody took her off of sugar and supplemented her with any lithium, chromium, and vanadium. And two years later, when her boyfriend realized how wacky she was at that time, tried to disengage and break off from her, and he used the kids as a foil purposely because most single mothers, when put to the test, you have to give up your kids if you want me to stay with you because you know, I'm not big enough to handle these kids. Every time I look at those kids, I see another man. He says, you've got to give up those kids. And most women would say, well, you're out of here, you bum. I'm not going to give up my kids. If you don't take the package deal, you don't get anything. But she didn't do that. The night before she drowned those two boys, she went from telephone to telephone, pay telephone to pay telephone in the parking lots of the 7-Elevens in Union, South Carolina. And she tried to call this guy because she figured out a way to make everybody happy. She remembered a little incident that happened to her when she was six years old. And it goes like this. When she was six years old, she had six kittens and she wanted to keep them all. She loved them all. But her daddy said, hey, we can only afford to take care of two, so you've got to give up four. And he took four of them out of her arms and put them into a sack with a brick and tied the sack and threw them into a pond and drowned them. He said, now that was painless. It didn't hurt those kittens. And they're happy because they're in heaven with God. And God's happy because those kittens are with him. And you're happy because you get to keep two instead of none. And I'm happy because I don't have to feed six. I only have to feed two. 
And she remembered that story and she said, well, I can make everybody happy here. I'll just drown those two boys and it'll be painless and they'll be happy because they'll be in heaven with God and God will be happy because they're in heaven with them and I'll be happy because I get my boyfriend and he'll be happy because he gets me without the kids. Nobody took her off of any sugar, natural process, or supplemented her with any lithium, chromium, or vanadium. One more tragic story here and then we'll get into the summary slides and then we'll open up for questions, see if there's any health challenges you want to talk about. This kid here, I could have picked out from his coloring projects when he was four years old, guaranteed. We call him the Willy Wonka serial killer. Now, how many of you have ever seen the movie Willy Wonka and the, and the Chocolate Factory? Raise your hand. Yeah, pretty fun little movie. We call him the Willy Wonka serial killer. When he was four years old, he was caught on the, on the shoulder of a little state highway in Indiana, HH, eating road kills like hard taco shells. I mean, we used to call these things sail cats. They were run over so many times, they were dry. You could use them like Frisbees, right? <laughs> Talk about pica and cribbing. I mean, he was eating road kills at age four. When he was seven years old, he was thought to be part of a satanic cult because he was twisting the heads off his neighbor's chickens and nailing them to the door jams, cutting the heads off their dogs and cats, putting them on pikes, and planting them in front of their yard. Cruelty to little animals. He wet the bed until he was 12 years old. When he was 13 years old, he was a full-blown alcoholic. He'd sit in class and drink beer cans and crunch them and disrupt the class, but his teachers were terrified to kick him out of class because he threatened to burn their house down. He loved to play with fire. All right? Now, because he was such a threatening kid, they gave him straight A's and graduated him a year early out of high school. <laughs> Moved him right along. He then joined the Army and uh, became a medic because he had such good grades. They made him a medic and encouraged him to apply to medical school. The only reason he did not get into medical school was he was being treated as an alcoholic in the Army. He said, hey, you dry out, <laughs> apply to medical school again, we'll take you. Well, after three years, the Army kicked him out as being a hopeless alcoholic. He moved up to Milwaukee, lived with his grandmother, and he worked in a chocolate factory for four years. And he ate chocolate for breakfast, lunch, and supper because it was free to employees. He used his minimum wage paycheck <clears throat> to buy alcohol and drugs at night. And in four years, when that chocolate didn't hold this horrible craving he had anymore, he killed, dismembered, and ate parts of 17 human beings. Jeffrey Dahmer. Nobody told him anywhere along his life to give up sugar and supplement with lithium, chromium, and vanadium. All they did was say, now, Jeffrey, it's not nice to kill, dismember, and eat people. We require 90 essential nutrients, 60 minerals, 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, and 3 essential fatty acids. And fortunately, for the thousands of years we've been around, we haven't had to think about this too much as human beings because our food plants, our grains, fruits, vegetables, and nuts take carbon dioxide from the air and manufacture long carbon chains, long carbon chains. And many of these long carbon chains are vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. And this is where this myth came from. You can get everything you need from your four food groups because plants do manufacture a certain amount of vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. But we've tried this experiment for 100 years or 200 years, and we've learned if you eat the four food groups and don't supplement, you can live to be an average of 75.5, about half of what we're genetically capable of. So I sat down one day and I said, well, how much of these grains, fruits, and vegetables, and nuts do you have to eat every day to live to be over 100? And I calculate you need six cups each of 15 different plant groups, grains, fruits, vegetables, and nuts, to get enough vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids to live to be over 100. That's 90 cups a day. It's a full bushel. Now, you have two problems if you want to do that. Number one, you have a capacity problem. If anybody in this room can eat a bushel of anything, I'll give you a $100 bill. Number two, if you eat a bushel of fruits and vegetables every day, guess where you're going to spend most of your life? <laughs> You guessed it, you're going to be on that little house pot, you know, going through about 10 rolls of Charmin a day. <laughs> You'll only be able to work with a laptop computer and a cellular telephone because you're not going, to be, <laughs> not going to be able to go anywhere else. So even though it is theoretically possible to get all the vitamins, and amino acids, and fatty acids you need from eating your four food groups, you can only expect to get 75.5, give or take, sometimes 80 years, sometimes 65 years, but on the average, 75.5. If you want to live to be over 100 and be healthful, you have to take in supplements of vitamins, amino acids, and fatty acids. Now, minerals are a different story. Plants cannot manufacture minerals. The only minerals that you find in plants are those that are in the soil in which they're grown. Plants will take up minerals out of the soil. And the reason why we're in trouble in America is for the last 100 years, we've used a simple fertilizer, NPK. 
nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. We did on our farm. People still do today, and they will for the next thousand years use the simple fertilizer NPK because it gives the farmer the maximum yield in terms of tons and bushels per acre. Farmers are paid for tons and bushels. Nobody gives a farmer any type of tax incentive or cash incentive to make sure that you get all 60 essential minerals. It's your responsibility. Farmers only generate tons and bushels per acre. That's what they do, and they do a very good job. We know that it only takes five to ten years to deplete the nutritional minerals out of our farm soils. And we've been using NPK for a hundred years. So, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that there is a uh, deficit there. U.S. Senate Document 264 says there's no longer any nutritional minerals left in our farm and range soils. And as a result, the crops that are grown there are minerally deficient. As a result, the animals and people who eat these minerally deficient crops get mineral deficiency diseases, and the only way to prevent and cure them is with mineral supplementation. That's U.S. Senate Document 264. Now, to me, the scary thing about U.S. Senate Document 264 is that it was written and published by the U.S. Senate in 1936. Sixty years ago, this information was known. Sixty years ago. This is not yesterday's news. It's 60 years old. This is the time at which we began to put vitamins and minerals and trace minerals into animal feeds to make up the deficit. Unfortunately, unfortunately for human beings, we got wonder drugs at the same time. We got sulfa drugs in 1936. We got penicillin in 38, cortisone in 42. And everybody was led to believe if we give medical research enough money and enough time, they'll find a wonder drug to fix everything. You just need to eat your four food groups and run around willy-nilly and everything will be all right. One of the studies that fascinated me in Rio in 1992 at the Earth Summit was this study here where they compared the amount of minerals in our farm and range soils compared to what was in there 100 years ago. African farm soils are 74% depleted. Asian farm soils are 76% depleted. European farm soils are 72% depleted. South America is 76%. The United States and Canada and North America is 85% depleted. We're 10 to 15% worse off than anybody else. And of course the reason is we had the Marshall Plan after the Second World War for 40 years. We fed the world more tons and bushels than they thought humanly possible to grow per acre. And all we put back in the soil was NPK, NPK. And then there were 16 years of the Russian wheat deals. And all we put back in the soil was NPK, NPK. That's why our soils are depleted. Now, if I haven't gotten your attention yet, I want to show you this map. This is an overlay map of the continental United States. The black areas have absolutely no selenium in it. And the dark gray areas is so irregular that you wouldn't want to bet your life on what may or may not be in there. So if you go to, to a, a farmer's market on the weekend or you have your own garden, what's the chances of you having enough selenium in your food to live to be 100 without supplementation? Zero. Every farmer knows about this and they put it in their animal feeds. Do you think animals just need it and not people? Okay. Let's look at two minerals before we wind it up. Let's look at uh, calcium, the number one mineral in the body. Your body contains more calcium than any other mineral. 147 different diseases if you're deficient in calcium. I'm just going to go over the top 10 with you. Osteoporosis, everybody knows about that. Today, it's the number 10 killer of adults over the age of 65. Remember, 75% don't live 90 days. You get complications from those fractures. It's a horrible disease in terms of human misery and dollars spent. $35,000 to have a hip replaced. Get them both replaced is $70,000. If that's uncomplicated. If it's complicated and have all kinds of problems, it might be $100,000, $200,000. Now, as a terrible disease as osteoporosis is in human beings, we don't have osteoporosis in animals. That's because farmers have a lot of common sense. Let's say a farmer out here has 100 head of cattle in his pasture and no calves this year, calls the vet out and he says, Hey, doc, I'm in trouble. I haven't had any calves this year, can't repay the operating loan. I lost a lot of money. He says, do I get rid of this herd? And the vet will come out and examine the cows. He says, no, the cows are all okay. But that bull up in that shed up there has osteoporosis of both hips, had so much pain, couldn't breed the cows. That's why I don't have any calves. He says, as a result, as a result, he said, um, what I want you to do is give me $70,000. I give that bull two new hips and next year you'll have some calves. Now, a farmer being very practical, he'd say, now stand over here, Doc, and he whips out his deer rifle and boom, blows away the bull. And while the kids are cutting the bull up into hamburger and roast and steaks, the farmer said, now, Doc, for $70,000, I can get a new bull every year for 70 years. I wasn't going to spend that kind of money on that old bull. But every once in a while, we get one we'd like to keep because he throws good calves. Can we prevent this osteoporosis thing? And the vet will say, well, sure. You want to prevent it, all you got to do is uh, 
take 10 cents every day in the pellets uh, worth of uh, calcium, 10 cents worth of calcium every day in the pellets of those calves when you wean them off the cow, and you won't get osteoporosis. And the farmer says, no, wait a minute. We can prevent a $70,000 to $100,000 vet bill simply with 10 cents a day worth of calcium? He says, yep. The farmer says, well, since I don't have Blue Cross Blue Shield, major medical hospitalization, Medicare, Medicaid, or Hillary to watch out for those calves, I've got to pay for this out of my own pocket. He says, I'm going to do the 10 cent a day calcium thing. That's why we don't have osteoporosis in animals. Receding gums. Dentists and, and dental hygienists will tell you to floss and brush after every meal. If you believe that receding gums can be prevented or cured by flossing and brushing, I have some oceanfront property in Idaho I'd like to sell you because you're an easy sell. Now, as a veterinarian, I've literally seen hundreds of thousands of animals. Rats, mice, rabbits, dogs, cats, sheep, pigs, horses, cows, lions and tigers and bears. And they don't floss and they don't get receding gums. Now, they do get funky breath because <laughs> they don't floss, but they don't get receding gums. Now, the reason why we don't get receding gums in animals is because we've dealt with the osteoporosis thing. If you have receding gums, regardless of your age, whether you're 12, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, it doesn't matter. If you have receding gums, loose teeth, gingivitis, pyorrhea, periodontitis, bridges or plates, you have osteoporosis of the face or jaw bones. You see this 20 to 50 years before you can recognize osteoporosis in the large bones of your arms, legs, hips, pelvis, and vertebrae. So if you have any of these problems, you have osteoporosis of the face and jaw bones. Arthritis. 85% of all arthritis is wear and tear arthritis. 85% of all arthritis is wear and tear arthritis. Osteoarthritis, degenerative arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. And of course, um, this is the type of arthritis that can be prevented, and you might get 100% better if you use Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula, which is made up out of a uh, liquid multiple, made up out of a liquid multiple, uh, plant-derived, that has 72 colloidal minerals in it. We'll talk about colloidal minerals in just a second. And um, a liquid multiple and the uh, um, gelatin we talked about, either Knox or Willamette Valley gelatin, either a half ounce or the, the uh, 12 capsules, and five ounces of the calcium-enriched Minute Maid orange juice. All that together makes up Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula and taken faithfully twice a day. Um, you have every honest expectation of getting significantly better or maybe even 100% better. Even if your neck sounds like a bag full of gravel, your joints sound like you have Rice Krispies in there, you know, snap, crackle, and pop. You can't get up out of your chair yourself. You have excruciating pain and so on. You want to give it a try if you have wear and tear arthritis. Hypertension. Again, we've already talked about this. Hypertension has nothing to do with salt intake. Salt restriction is not going to prevent it or fix it. Hypertension, high blood pressure is actually due. 85% of all hypertension is due to a calcium deficiency. Take in three times the... RDA recommended daily allowance by your government and according to the inner salt study and the study from Toronto Medical School the calcium will resolve your high blood pressure. Insomnia. As you roll around all night, wake up in the morning more tired when you went to bed. Contrary to popular belief by physicians, it's not due to a barbiturate deficiency or, an or a halcyon deficiency. It's due to a calcium deficiency. Kidney stones, bone spurs, heel spurs and calcium deposits the medical profession has the malignant, dumb belief that these things are due to too much calcium in your diet. And the first advice they give you when you have any of these problems, give up all dairy and for God's sake don't take any supplements with calcium in it. When in fact, when you get kidney stones, bone spurs, heel spurs, and calcium deposits, you have raging osteoporosis. It's your own calcium being moved around. You need more calcium, more magnesium, not less. I want you to be honest with me. How many of you ever had a foot cramp, toe cramp, leg cramp, eyelid twitch or anything like that in your life, raise your hand. Yeah, that's the first symptom of a calcium deficiency. And if you're honest, you'll, you'll fess up to that. And myself, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, my eyelids used to twitch so violently you could hear them click. And I used to look into the, into the mirror and say, do people see that or is that my imagination? And one day I got the twitching and the clicking together <clears throat> and I called my mom and she came in. She didn't know what it was, so she panicked. We jumped in the car and we drove 80 miles to St. Louis and I ran into my first female doctor when I was 14 years old. Now remember, she's an eye doctor. Her name was Mary Jane Skeffington. Mary Jane Skeffington, the eye doctor, for some reason, I'm 14 years old, she had me stripped down to my jockey underwear. <clears throat> now back then, I was just a dumb redneck kid from the farm. And I didn't know any better. Whatever she said, I did. Now today, if an eye doctor were to do that, you could go on Geraldo or Oprah and say you were sexually harassed by your eye doctor, right? 
But at any rate, she kept looking in my eye with this ophthalmoscope for an hour and then go see another patient. She'd look into my eye with an ophthalmoscope, see another patient. She went on and on and on for two hours and finally said, Doc, you, you know, listen, I, I play junior varsity football. I'm the captain of the wrestling team. I actually um, uh, am on the weightlifting team. And if you have to amputate my eyelids, go for it. I can handle whatever you need to do. So she goes into her office, she comes back, she has a little Maybelline mascara eyelash brush and a little mirror in one of those little plastic boxes. And I said, what's that for? She says, well, the structure of your eye seems to be okay, but you have these real long eyelashes. They've grown forward, hit your eyeglasses, they've curled back and are tickling your eyeball. And that's what's causing your eyelids to twitch. <laughs> I said, you're kidding me. She says, no, that appears to be what it is. And I said, well, well, what do we do about it? And she says, well, what I want you to do is every hour, I want you to alternate eyes, take 15 minutes, uh, in each hour and work and, and retrain those eyelashes and she starts demonstrating to me she you know you got to do it like this I said no wait a minute <clears throat> let's get this straight you want me to sit on the football bench with 25 guys <laughs> weighing over 200 pounds this is in 1950 right <laughs> and you want me to sit there with a Maybelline mascara eyelash brush and play with my eyelashes and not only does my team have cleats on their feet, there's these guys across the field, 25 guys over 200 pounds. I said, you've got to be crazy. So I put on my pants. I said, she doesn't know anything about football. Right? So I, I went marching to the school library, and I found a health book out of desperation <clears> that was written by two nurses. And I looked in the index, and it said muscle cramps, muscle twitches. I looked in the book where it said to look, and sure enough, it said this is all due to a calcium deficiency. And I said, I ain't know how to solve this problem. I know where we have some calcium. It's in the calf pellets in the barn. So I ran to the barn. I started filling all my pockets and my pants and my shirt and my jacket with calf pellets. And the next day at school, everybody else is eating M&Ms and jelly beans. Old Wallach is eating calf pellets because the alternative was the Maybelline mascara eyelash treatment. <laughs> so I was motivated. <laughs> now, in four to five days, all those cramps and twitches went away. All those cramps and twitches went away. So when I was 14 years old, I knew that doctors didn't know anything about nutrition and that eye doctors perhaps should go back to school and learn some anatomy because they didn't know where the eyes were. <laughs> PMS, premenstrual syndrome, the University of California, San Diego came out six years ago and said that 85% uh, of the emotional and physical stuff of PMS can be relieved, prevented and cured, they're using the cure word, not me, by tripling your intake of calcium over and above the RDA. Now low back pain that's a pretty common thing, low back pain. How many of you, either yourself or have known somebody that had a disc surgery for back pain and still had pain or more pain after the surgery? Raise your hand. Isn't that amazing? Almost 40, 50 percent of the people in the room. Now, Harvard Medical School is getting the same feedback and they said there's something wrong with this picture. We're doing these heroic disc surgeries to relieve pain and 50 percent of the people are still having pain. So they looked at it and they said, Okay, here's what we're going to do. They took 1,700 people who had no history of back problems, never, never had a back problem, and they were in the teaching hospital at Harvard for, say, cataract operations, 1,700 of them. They did CAT scans on their back. 85% of those 1,700 people had bulging, degenerative, and ruptured disc. And Harvard Medical School, eight months ago, came out and said, if anybody gets a disc operation for back pain, it's medical fraud because disc problems do not cause back pain. Disc problems can cause tingling, numbness, and paralysis, but not back pain. When you have low back pain, you have cramps and spasms of the large muscles of your back. You can have subluxations or malalignments of the vertebrae. You can have bone spurs, calcium deposits, arthritis, osteoporosis, but not disc problems. If you have any of these top ten problems, I'm going to try Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula before you, you know, elect to have any surgery. Don't be like the average American who spends between $25,000 and $250,000 and undergoes five to ten surgical procedures for nothing more than the top ten calcium deficiency diseases in America. It's really a terrifying thing that people can be talked into that. Okay. Last disease, one more slide after this. Diabetes, the number three killer of adults in the United States, causes blindness of all kinds, kidney failure, kidney dialysis, kidney transplant, contributes to the numbers of cardiovascular disease, the number one killer of adults in the United States. Amputations of toes, feet, and legs for ulcers that won't heal and gangrene. And most times you really don't have to get an amputation to resolve those problems. But if you insist on getting something amputated, please, please put a tag on it so they get the right one. <laughs> you know, if you guys go in for an inguinal surgery operation, you want to get a do not remove sign and put it in the appropriate place. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> okay. Now, 
When your doctor diagnoses a new diabetic patient in his office, he excuses himself, goes into his private office, drops to his knees and gives thanks to the Lord, then he jumps up and he calls his real estate agent because he knows over 20, 30, 40 years you're going to go through all these problems if you follow the standard treatment or management of uh, diabetes in human medicine. And as a result, over 20, 30, 40 years, you're worth to him $250,000 to $500,000. It's like adding another cow to the dairy herd. They know exactly how much you're worth to them as a diabetic. And if you don't think that's true, next time you visit a doctor, ask to see his medical um, business office journals. You know, they have business journals for doctors. And see what they say about diabetic patients and heart patients and cancer patients and how much on the average. That's why people pick certain specialties because there's big bucks in that area. Now, to me, this is criminal because in 1957, we learned that we could prevent and cure adult onset diabetes in animals by supplementing with two trace minerals, chromium and vanadium chromium and vanadium. And uh, 11 years ago, 1985, the medical school up at British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, came out and said that the trace mineral vanadium alone could replace insulin for adult onset diabetics, who again make up 85% of the diabetic population. Science that dog food contains 40 minerals in a complete analysis, always contains lithium, chromium, vanadium, and selenium. Ralston Purina Laboratory Rat Pellets always contains a minimum of 28 minerals, and they always contain lithium, chromium, vanadium, and selenium. And I'll give anybody in this audience a crisp new $100 bill if you can find me a human infant formula that contains more than 12 minerals. None of them contain lithium, chromium, vanadium, and only one, pro soybean, the one that has 12, has selenium in it. None of the rest do. They have 11, 10, 9, or 8 minerals. That's why they call Similac Similac, because it lacks everything. Now, if I've convinced you that minerals and nutrition are important to preventing disease and adding health and longevity to your life, you have to be responsible for this because your doctor doesn't get 30 seconds worth of clinical nutrition in their medical school. And as a result, this is a blind spot for them. It's something they never consider when a person comes in with a health challenge. They never consider this aspect of the disease. Now, you have to know three things about minerals. Number one, there's three types of mineral supplements. There's the original going back since time immemorial, since the beginning of time. There's elemental or metallic minerals. These are things like limestone, oyster shell, eggshell, seabed minerals, coral calcium, things like um, oh, clays of various types. Tums is a modern version of it. 8 to 12 percent availability to animals and people. We're not designed to consume ground up rocks, if you will, to get our minerals. Have you ever wondered why people dread being 50 years old? Why the whole population of the world suddenly falls apart when they hit 50, you know, the teeth get loose, the hair goes, whatever you got left is gray, low back problems, high blood pressure, sugar in your urine, interest in sex goes away. Everybody dreads the big 5-0, right? Well, the reason is our ability to absorb these elemental types of minerals precipitously drops to 3 to 5 percent. About three years ago, a guy in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, jumps up in the back of the room and says, hey, doc, now I know what I see in my porta potty business. I said, what do you see in your porta potty business? He said, well, when we clean those things out and disinfect them so we can use them again, we find hundreds and hundreds of vitamin pills that come through people. I said, come on now, how do you know they're vitamin pills? He said, well, it's easy. They say Theragram M, one a day, Centrum, and Centrum Silver right on the coating. So next time you're on the pot and you hear plop, plop, clink, clink, it's not poker chips coming through there. It's them pills. Are there any chiropractors in the audience tonight? Any chiropractors? Any chiropractors? Raise your hand so I can see. Well, I can't see any, huh? Okay, well, the reason why I ask that is because chiropractors take spinal x-rays. And when a chiropractor takes a spinal x-ray, guess what he sees? He sees all these pills lined up. And if a person tends to be constipated, those pills line up like little boxcars waiting to come out. <laughs> come on, let me out! <laughs> let me out, they want to get through. Now, a lot of people say to me, Doc, Listen, you know, are you kind of fibbing to us a little bit here, pulling our leg? I mean, I've taken 2,000 milligrams of calcium every day for 20 years. I take a thousand milligram, two of those thousand milligram tablets every day for 20 years, and I still have insomnia, foot cramps, toe cramps, high blood pressure, bone spurs, heel spurs, arthritis, loose teeth. My neck sounds like a bag full of gravel, and I say, well, "What kind do you take?" And they'll say, "Calcium carbonate, calcium gluconate, calcium lactate," and that's the problem, because out of a thousand milligram calcium lactate tablet. 86% or 860 milligrams is lactose or milk sugar. Only 14% or 140 milligrams is elemental or metallic calcium. And let's not use these complicated numbers up here for absorption and usability. Let's take 10% of the um, 
140 milligrams is an honest number, and also it's easy math. 10% of 140 milligrams is 14 milligrams. So if you take two of those 1,000 milligram tablets a day of calcium lactate or calcium carbonate or calcium gluconate, you're not getting 2,000 milligrams of calcium. You're getting two times 14 or 28 milligrams. To get enough, to get enough calcium, to get 2,000 milligrams of usable calcium from a calcium lactate 1,000 milligram tablet, you have to take 30 of those with each meal. You have to take 90 a day. That's almost a full 100 tablet bottle. And the cheapest, the five, you know, five um, uh, bucks a bottle, it's 150 bucks a month just for calcium. You got 59 more minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, and three essential fatty acids to go. So this is not a, an efficient way financially to uh, take in minerals because you got all these other nutrients to deal with. Plus you got the plop, plop, ding, ding factor, you know. <laughs> and uh, additionally, you're going to develop. A, a, another physician-caused disease, if they tell you to take this type of calcium, you're going to develop what I call BNF disease. BNF disease stands for belching and farting. <laughs> if you take in a 90 capsules of anything a day, you're going to develop BNF disease. You're going to sound like an elephant out in the woods with a horrible belly problem. <laughs> and you know you got it when your spouse has to throw a canary in the bathroom to see if it's safe to go in there. Now, during the 60s, the animal industry came up with chelated minerals because no farmer is dumb enough to put a dollar in an animal's mouth and have 99 cents come out in the manure. So we learned by adding amino acids and proteins and enzymes, which are proteins that do work, to the elemental mineral, it increases the absorbability from 3 to 5% to 40%. And everybody got excited about this during the 60s. And today, because of this research, you'll see a mixture of elemental minerals and chelated minerals in a good multivitamin mineral supplement, you know, a tablet. But the way that animals and people are designed to consume and absorb minerals is in the colloidal form. Colloidal minerals are 98% available to animals and people, two and a half times more available than the chelated minerals, 10 times more available than elemental or metallic. They're liquid in form by definition. They cannot be powders and capsules and pills and tablets. They must be liquid, small particle size. They're 7,000 times smaller than a red blood cell, and they're negatively charged. It's one of the unique things about a colloidal mineral is they are all negatively charged, and as you know, like charges repel. So between being a small particle and they repel each other, they stay in suspension forever as long as you don't let the water evaporate. Now the way it's supposed to be is that <clears throat> animals and human beings are supposed to eat plants, and the plants are supposed to take the elemental minerals out of the soil, convert them to colloidal minerals for their own use, for their own metabolism and biochemistry. We eat the plants, and that's how animals and people are designed to consume and absorb minerals. In the plant farm, colloidal minerals, we are not designed to eat ground-up rocks. Unfortunately, U.S. Senate Document 264 in 1936 says there's no more minerals left in our farm and rain soils. Unfortunately, in 1992, the Earth Summit in Rio says there's no more minerals left in our farm and rain soils, and plants cannot manufacture minerals. If there's no minerals in the soil, they cannot, make, they cannot convert these minerals to colloidal minerals, and they cannot manufacture minerals. Now, what about these long-lived cultures that were written up in the National Geographic in January of 1973. What, what's, what's special about them? Is it genetic? No, they're all different races, they're all different religions, different cultures. The Tibetans from certain mountain tribes up there in the Himalayas and the Hunzas in the eastern Pakistan and the Karakorum Mountains, the Russian Georgians, Azerbaijanis, Abkhazians, and the Turkestanis in the Caucasus Mountains in Ru uh, western Russia, and the Vilcabamba Indians from the Andes of Ecuador, and my favorites, I just like the name, the Titicacas, in the Andes of Peru. <laughs> what could possibly be a common denominator between all these peoples? Well, there are two. Number one, even though they're different religions and different races, they were all persecuted people. They were all victims being chased by the king's men or bandits or whatever, and they chose to live in what would be called the bad lands of their country. I mean, horrible, nothing, no soil, nothing but rock. <clears throat> and just out of the throw of the dice, nothing that they thought about, they picked places to live in that had 60 to 72 minerals in the parent rock of the mountains they chose to live in. Number two, they chose places that had less than two inches of precipitation a year, no rain, no snow to speak of, so they had to pick places that had a permanent water supply, and every one of these cultures picked places that were within 50 to 100 miles of glaciers, and they all built aqueducts to carry water from glaciers to their place where they lived and worked and farmed. Now, the water that comes out from underneath of glaciers is not clear, like tap water, Perrier, Evian, or glacier water, or geyser water, or Calistoga water. It's called glacial milk 
because the water that comes out from underneath the glaciers has so much rock dust or rock flour suspended in it that um, it's called glacial milk. It looks like whole milk, kind of a bluish white, bluish gray, as opposed to clear. And if you boil away a quart of glacial milk, you get two inches of minerals in the bottom of that quart jug. By contrast, boil away a quart of Evian or Perrier water at 20 bucks a gallon. I mean, we're talking price here compared to gasoline. Would you ever have thought that water would be more expensive than gasoline? Kind of interesting, isn't it? Now, you boil away a quart of Evian or Perrier water, you'll get as much mineral as you get on the head of a pin. A big contrast. Now, not only did these people drink this highly mineralized water and get 8 to 12 percent and 3 to 5 percent after age 50 because it's metallic minerals, it's ground up rocks as these glaciers move up and down the mountains. More important than drinking it, they irrigated with it. Week after week, month after month, year after year, generation after generation, for 2,500 to 5,000 years, they irrigated with this glacial milk. They replaced literally thousands of tons of these minerals back into the soil every year through this irrigation with this glacial milk. And all their plants are rich with these colloidal minerals as a result. And all we do is put in NPK, 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 and it takes five to 10 years to deplete these nutritional minerals from our soil. As a result, last year we paid $1.2 trillion, that's with a T, $1.2 trillion for health care. These people don't get diabetes, they don't get heart disease, osteoporosis, arthritis, cancer, they don't get glaucoma, they don't get cataracts, they don't have birth defects, they don't have jails full of violent criminals and drug addicts, they don't have a single hospital, they don't have Blue Cross Blue Shield major medical hospitalization, they don't have a single doctor, and they don't have these diseases, and they live to be over 120 to 140. Now, can you live to be over 120, 140 without colloidal minerals? No. Can you get all these colloidal minerals out of our food supply in the United States? No. Well, can you keep all the things that we love about the United States? Because if I were to pay your way to go there and live and guarantee you'd live to be over 100, you wouldn't do it because they don't have Kenmore kitchens, they don't have electricity, they don't have central heat, central air, they don't have roads, they don't have cars, they don't have televisions, they don't have television channel changer. I mean, how can you be a couch potato without a television channel changer? So can you have all these things we love about America, you know, including health insurance, and, and still get colloidal minerals? And the answer is, of course, yes. These colloidal minerals are available to you. They've been around since 1926. And, of course, they're plant-derived. They actually come from an ancient prehistoric plant deposit. Um, about 1926, there was this, this prospector who was an abysmal failure in southeastern Utah who noticed when he, um, even though he couldn't find gold or silver, but he did notice when he drank this funky-tasting water in the stream, the only water source available to him, after a couple of weeks, his arthritis went away. And he backtracked this stream, and he found that it originated in a prehistoric valley that had a forest in it. And when these um, trees and brush and grasses took up all the elemental minerals from the soil, converted them to colloidal minerals for their own use, there was a cataclysmic event. That forest was entombed, that valley and that forest was entombed by a, a volcanic eruption, a very thin layer of mud, ash, and lava, not heavy enough to compress this stuff into coal or oil. And it was very arid in there, not enough moisture to fossilize or petrify this plant material. So today, if you look at it, it just looks like real dark chocolate coffee grounds. And you squeeze it between your fingers, you squeeze it between your fingers, it uh, is the same consistency as a chocolate chip you might put in an oatmeal cookie. It's kind of waxy. That's because it's not rock, it's ground up plant material. We grind this stuff up into a flour, we soak it in a filtered spring water for four to six weeks, and we leach those colloidal minerals out of those plants that were taken up in the prehistoric days. Things that you can't get out of your soil and your food anymore today. And of course, that's been around since 1926. We have liquid multiples uh, that have been around, oh, 10 years and one year and so forth, and these are all available to you also. I want to thank you all very much. God bless each and every one of you, and God bless America. It shocks most people when they learn that we need 90 essential nutrients. We need 60 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 essential amino acids, and 3 essential fatty acids. It's even a bigger shock to most people when they learn that man's best friend, the dog, gets 40 minerals in his food. Our laboratory rats get uh, 28 minerals or less in his food. And the human infant, in their formula, gets 12 or less. Our dogs get 40 minerals, our rats get 28, and their own kids get 12 or less. It's really a dog's life. It's these minerals, it's the secret. Glaciers grind up these rocks, comes out in the form of glacial milk, 
And these people have irrigated with this glacial milk season after season, year after year, generation after generation, for 2,500 to 5,000 years, depending on the culture. The secret lies in the minerals that come from these glaciers and these mountains. U.S. Senate Document 264 says that our farm and rain soils are depleted in minerals, and as a result, these crops are deficient in minerals, and as a result of that, animals and people who eat on these crops get mineral deficiency diseases. When one considers the budget that the American family puts into their food each month, and the fact that U.S. Senate Document 264 says there's no longer any nutrients left in our farm soils and therefore in our foods, it's not outrageous to think of uh, making sure that through a couple of dollars a day you get all 90 essential nutrients. It's kind of like the modern version of an apple a day keeps the doctor away. If you really want to find out what health is like, don't wait for the government, don't wait for insurance, don't wait for Medicare and Medicaid to do it. They're not going to do it for you. They can't do it for you, even if they wanted to. Take control of your own health. Do it today. Don't wait. Thank you for viewing this presentation, and remember to contact the person that sent this to you. For more presentations and books that go into greater detail, go to docwallachmedia.com. And be well. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. The opinions expressed in this informational program are the express opinions of Joel D. Wallach, B.S. D.V.M. N.D., are not a replacement for proper medical advice and treatment. In all cases, we recommend you contact your physician directly regarding any medical conditions.